I would like I would like to um, um, make public that we are going to have a, a final uh, uh, meeting of uh, all participants uh, just after uh, John's talk, which is uh, the last one, in order to uh, summarize uh, what have been uh, presented uh, and uh, to discuss uh, implications of it. So everybody uh, is uh, welcome to, to stay on board also uh, after uh, 2 p.m. So uh, I'm going to chair uh, the session of the next uh, three papers. Uh, the first one is by Julia Cage, and um, she's at the Sciences Po in uh, Paris and is going to uh, talk about the price of democracy. Julia, you have uh, 30, uh, 35 minutes and then uh, 15 or 10 minutes for discussion. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to share my slides. Is that okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay, uh, so the, the presentation today will be uh, mostly based uh, on my book, the, the Price of Democracy, uh, How Money Shapes Politics uh, and What to Do About It. And I think this is uh, strongly related uh, to the, the, the discussion that are taking place at, uh, at this conference, uh, as you will be able to, uh, to see, because the, the growing role that money is playing into politics in uh, all Western democracies uh, with variation, but this is a phenomena that we observe uh, everywhere, is also one of the reasons why uh, we are so far in all these democracies uh, to be able to uh, implement uh, important reforms uh, toward, uh, toward socialism. Uh, the, the, the book, you see the cover here, there is also a website uh, associated to uh, the book, thepriceofdemocracy.com, uh, where you will find the summary of, of the book as well as a lot of data uh, that are uh, available online if you want to reproduce some of the, of the finding of, uh, of this work. So, uh, the, the departure point for, for, for this work uh, is the following. Uh, it is the idea that uh, the crisis of representation we uh, observed uh, everywhere, either in the US, in the UK, in France, in Italy, Germany, uh, Spain, in all Western democracies. In fact, this crisis uh, is partly linked uh, to the capture of the democratic game by uh, private interest. Uh, something that is of interest when you, you, you try to understand uh, why uh, people uh, no longer vote or when they do vote, they tend to vote increasingly uh, for the far right uh, in a number of countries. Uh, the, the, the usual answer is to say that uh, they do not vote or uh, they no longer trust democracy uh, because they think that uh, politicians uh, no longer represent them. Uh, and in a sense, uh, we will see that uh, this is partly true uh, because politicians tend uh, to uh, represent uh, people who fund them uh, people who fund the political parties, people who fund the electoral uh, campaigns, uh, more than they fund, uh, let's say, the average uh, average citizen. Uh, what, what is new? We, we already have a lot of uh, evidence of uh, the role played by uh, money uh, in politics. Uh, what is uh, new in this work, in a sense, is two things. Uh, the first thing is really to do uh, a tour of the world, and the second one is to do a travel through time. Uh, the the idea is to say that uh, first of all. This issue of uh, private interest capturing democracy is not new. Uh, the fact that it is not new, it means that it has already been tackled uh, by politicians, uh, by governments in a number of different countries. Uh, the US began with, uh, but a long time ago, and it's uh, of interest to try to understand why uh, some reforms uh, worked and why other reforms uh, failed. Uh, so we, we can learn a lot, in fact, uh, from the history of uh, campaign finance regulation all over the world. And the other thing is that if you look again uh, at a number of Western democracies, you see that uh, there are a lot of lessons uh, that can be drawn uh, from different systems because all the, all the countries differ in a number of ways. And the idea is to say, by, by looking at history, by having this uh, comparative approach, we can better understand uh, the power of private money, but we can also try to find better way to regulate this power of private money uh, and to have a democracy that will be in the future defined as uh, one person, uh, one vote, and no longer as uh, uh, one dollar, uh, one vote. And so this is what I do. I try to uh, establish a number of uh, facts, both uh, historically and in a comparative way. 
And from these facts, I am going to uh, make a number of proposals that are based on these historical experiences. Uh, the first one will be the implementation of democratic equality vouchers, uh, which is an egalitarian and dynamic public funding scheme. And the second one is what uh, I called a mixed assembly, uh, whose goal is to improve working class representation. Uh, obviously, after Isabel's uh, talk yesterday, you already have a, a sense of a number of different proposals uh, that have been made uh, to improve working class representation, either in the firms or in politics. Uh, and I think uh, what we really need uh, is to have uh, ideas and proposals uh, such as that, uh, the, the, the one done by uh, Isabel or the discussion we had uh, with Hélène Landemore also yesterday. And this is like one additional piece of proposal in this, uh, in this large, uh, large debate. So the, the, the departure point, in fact, uh, of, the, uh, of the book is very simple, but we, we tend to forget it uh, too often. And it's the idea that uh, democracy has a cost. Democracy has a cost because, first of all, campaign has a cost. It does not mean that uh, we need to do in all, uh, all the countries, uh, like we, we don't need to spend uh, as much money in other countries as uh, we do observe in the US, for example. Uh, it's not necessary, you know, for a presidential election uh, to spend the $3 billion uh, in terms of campaign expenditures. And uh, th there are a lot of things that uh, we should regulate uh, much better. For example, uh, forbid uh, advertising on television in the countries uh, in which it is not the case uh, for political campaign. Democracy also has a cost because of the funding of political parties, which is also not a bad thing per se. It's important to have political parties. Political parties as a, are a place uh, where we can uh, build and develop ID, exchange with citizens, uh, try to uh, uh, build a program for, 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 the, for the future. And you know, this, this cost of democracy, the, the, the issue is not so much uh, the, the, the magnitude of the cost, but the issue would be more uh, the one of who is going to pay for this cost. And what, what is of interest, so these are just some very simple statistics, but to, to give you a sense of this cost of democracy is that we have a, a lot of variation uh, if you compare uh, different countries uh, between them. So for example, here I am plotting the average spending per adult of the different political parties from the far left to the far right in Germany, Belgium, Spain, France, Italy, and the UK. Uh, when you see this graph, you might think, huh, how is it that uh, German people and Spanish people spent much more money on politics than uh, France and the UK? Is it because they are more interested into politics? Uh, in fact, it is not the case. Uh, there is nothing that is due like to cultural preferences here. These are just due to difference in, in regulation. It turns out that in Germany, uh, you have both a pretty generous uh, public funding system for political parties and no limit uh, to private donations. So at the end of the day, all the German political parties receive a lot of money, both from the state and from large donors. In a country like Spain, uh, regulation has changed uh, in recent years, and uh, there is a pretty strict uh, limitation uh, to private donations, but the public funding scheme is also very generous, and this is why you see this, uh, these uh, differences in, uh, in spending. The, only, the other thing you see here, obviously, is the differences between political parties. Uh, it's not as if all the political parties were receiving the same amount of money, and of course, I'm going to uh, come back to this point uh, later. Uh, so the Democracy has a cost, okay? And in fact, what is key is that if this cost of democracy is not funded equally by all the citizens through public funding, and I'm going to argue in favor of public funding pretty strongly, then it will be captured by uh, private interest. And this is something that is uh, not easy uh, to convince uh, citizens of, uh, of this necessity uh, to publicly fund uh, democracy, because in general, you know, if you have a crisis of representation and people do not vote, do not trust politicians, and then you tell people we should spend even, even more money, you know, uh, to fund political parties, they are going to oppose this claim. But in fact, this is what uh, needs to be done. And I think a, a good comparison here is, is with the media industry. Uh, I have, I've worked for, for a long time in, uh, in media economics, and one of the things people is, is, are not realizing is the, is the following. Uh, when you ask people, do you consume news? The majority of the people are going to say yes. So they do consume news. Then you ask people, do you subscribe to a media outlet? 
increasingly people are going to tell you no. So they do not pay directly for uh, the news they consume. Then you ask people, are you willing to see some like ads uh, to pay for the news uh, you, consu you consume? And more and more you realize uh, that people do have an ad blocker on their consumer, on their computer. So they don't want to pay for news uh, through uh, the use of advertising. Then you might think this is not so much of an issue. You need to fund news uh, through public funding. So let's have public funding, let's have media vouchers uh, to fund the news. But when you do some survey and you ask people about the, the, the funding of the media, uh, people are not willing to spend more public money to fund the media. They tend to be willing to spend even less public money to fund the media. And then you just have to ask people. So you consume news, but you don't pay for it directly. You don't pay for it through advertising. You do not pay from it uh, as a taxpayers. So who is willing to spend money to give you news to consume for free? And when you look at uh, the shareholder structure of the media outlets as of today, what do we see? We see in all Western democracies, increasingly large uh, billionaires uh, that buy some media outlets and that buy some influence thanks to the ownership of this media. And I think it's a little bit the same thing for the funding of democracy. If you ask individual citizens, are you willing to pay for the funding of democracy through public money, they're going to tell you no. But then they need to realize that if they do not pay for it as taxpayers, then there will always be some like billionaires who will, be, who will agree to fund this uh, political parties and campaigns. And when they do so, it's not for free. It's to buy some power and to buy some influence and to buy some politics, okay. And the truth is, we know, and in fact, we have known uh, from a long time, this is uh, from some work by uh, Adam Bonica and Howard uh, Rosenthal. We know that donations to political parties are very strongly associated with uh, social class positions. So this is not as if democracy was funded by private money and everyone was giving like $10 uh, to its preferred party. This is not what we observe in the data. What we observe in the data is that a minority of very rich people tend to fund disproportionately uh, the political life. When you say that to people, in particular in Europe, they say that's true, but that's an American issue. We do, do not have such a problem uh, in European democracies. And in particular, when you say that, uh, to people in France, they say, that's okay, but that's a US problem because look at France, for example, uh, there is a cap on how much you can give to political parties. And that's true, if, if, you, if, if you look at France, uh, one person cannot give more sa than 7,500 euros per year to a political party. Obviously, if I tell you that and uh, you are based in the US, uh, you look at me like, okay, so we really do not care, like seven, 1,500 uh, euros to a political parties, uh, this is political equality. The thing uh, is that uh, it is far from being political equality. 7,500 uh, euros, it's half of the annual wage of a French workers uh, uh, earning uh, the minimum wage. Okay. The vast majority of the people, first of all, the vast majority of the people they do not give, now, if you look at the people who give to political parties and campaign, you rank them thanks to the use of unique fiscal data, depending on their income. You see that for the bottom 99% of the population, when people give to a political party or to a campaign, they give on average around uh, 120 euros per year. And then do so because they do not have much more money to give. Now, if you look uh, among the top 0.001% of the people whose income in the, is the highest, they give more than 5,500 uh, euros per year. And in fact, the majority of them, they give up to the spending limit. And if you look at the gap between the average, the majority of the population and this top donor, 
you see that the top donors give an average 35 times more than all the other donors. And so they have 35 times more power or even more if the relationship is not linear. And this is where you see that even in a country like France, when you believe that you have regulated the role played by money in politics, it's not the case if you allow such differences. And what you need to have are much uh, smaller caps. And I'm going to argue in favor of capping political donations uh, to 200 euros per person and per, uh, per year. Uh, in the book, I, I show this evidence from the US. I, I show a lot of evidence from France because I, I have this very nice uh, fiscal data. We have different data sets in different countries that do not allow you to compute exactly the same statistics. But if you look at the different uh, countries, these are like two more examples, one from the UK, one from Germany, you see exactly the same big picture. Uh, all the uh, private funding of political parties and campaigns is between the end of uh, a very low number of uh, very large donors, okay? Then some people will tell you, okay, that's true. But should we really care? Because you know, if people give uh, the same amount to uh, the Socialist Party in France or the Democratic Party in the US and to the Republican Party on the right, at the end of the day, the money comes from private sources, uh, but the repartition will be equal uh, all along the political spectrum. This, I am not even sure that I need to spend a lot of time on, on that because it's, it's, it's kind of obvious ex ante, but it's better to look at the data. Uh, when you look at the data, you, 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 you find that it is not the case. Uh, and you find that uh, right-wing parties, uh, the pro-business parties uh, in all the different countries, they tend to receive much more donation than uh, the left-wing uh, left parties. And this has very important uh, implications for the discussions we are uh, having together in this, uh, in this conference, okay? Because this is one of the reasons why, I'm not claiming this is the only why, only one, but this is one of the reasons why we observe historically the fact that left-wing parties, the Democrats in the US, and this was very clear with uh, the campaign in 2016 of Hillary Clinton, that's been the case of uh, the Partito Democratico uh, in Italy with Matteo Renzi. Uh, it has been the case of the Social Democrats in Germany uh, with Gerald Schroeder. It has been the case of uh, the Labour Party uh, at the time of uh, Tony Blair uh, in Britain. And in fact, it, this has been the case uh, in France, both with François Hollande at the very beginning. And then like uh, Emmanuel Macron is completely the end of this shift uh, that the fact that these left-wing parties, rather than defending some socialist values and reforms toward socialism and participatory socialism, they have shifted pro-business, okay, and they have abandoned redistribution and inequality. And this is not just uh, about their program, it's also about uh, the growing inequalities that we observe both between and within countries uh, since a number of uh, since a number of decades. Okay. The last thing I want to highlight uh, is that not only this system is unfair, because obviously it gives much more power to people who have more money uh, to fund political parties and campaign, but this is a regressive system in a number of countries when you have tax credit for political donations. In a country like France, you have to know that if a rich guy gives 6,000 euros to a political party, the state is going to give him back 4,000 euros. And so the real cost for him will be 2,000 euros. Okay. So two thirds of his political preferences will be funded by all the citizens. So in fact, by the poorest. And we're in this completely crazy system where not only the poorest have less voice in the democratic system, but where at the end of the day, they do pay to satisfy the political preferences of uh, the richest, okay? For those of you who are based in the US or in the UK, you might say, okay, but we do not really care because at least in the US and the UK, we, we were uh, clever enough uh, not to have income tax credit for political donations. The thing is, we are not in a world where on the one hand there is politics and on the other hand, there are all the other non-profit organizations. 
we do know that a lot of nonprofit organizations are indeed doing politics in a sense. And we do observe the same regressive and unfair system at play for uh, philanthropy, this fiscal injustice that is very well documented, for example, uh, in the case of the US uh, by uh, Rob Reich in his uh, book, Just Giving. The last thing that I want to highlight, uh, and these are data that are available on the website, the, the price of democracy.com. Uh, what I did on this website is that I took on the legislative and municipal election in France between 1993 and 2017. I took all the general elections in the UK between 18, 15, seven and 2017. So like 150 years of data. And in both countries, what do you observe? is that if you put on a plot on the x-axis the share of the expenditures represented by each candidate at general elections and on the y-axis the share of the voice obtained by each of these candidates basically you more or less obtained a 45 degree line if you want to play with that uh, you, you can go on the on the website thepriceofdemocracy.com you can play with any election you want in the france in the uk for 150 years pick your candidates or your uh, district and you will find the exact same relationship. And this is one additional reason why we should care uh, about the role played by uh, money in politics. But on top of this, because this we already know that, even if uh, you have some discussion in the literature about the exact causal uh, uh, effect of, you know, one additional dollar in terms of one additional vote, this has other very important consequences, uh, in particular for discussion today. And the main uh, consequences is that because of the way democracy is funded, politicians tend to take into account the preferences of uh, the most uh, influence. Uh, there is uh, this great book, Influence and Affluence, that really shows that this idea that at the end of the day, when you look at the preferences of the poor, and when you look at the preferences of the rich, and when the preferences of the poor and of uh, the rich do not coincide, the politicians are going to take into account the preferences of the most influenced. And that is a very beautiful way of framing it by saying that, in fact, democracy has worked until now because by coincidence, it turns out that the preferences of the poor and the preferences of the rich on a number of topics, it tends to be the same. But what we do observe today is that with the increasing inequalities, you have more and more divergence between the preferences of the poor and the preferences of the rich. And at the, day, at the end of the day, this leads uh, to the crisis of, uh, of representations. Let me jump on that. Uh, I, I just want to highlight one thing that is what uh, we shouldn't do in front of this crisis of representation. Okay. In general, when you, you, you present in, in front of like a large general audience, this fact, the fact that the funding of democracy is completely unequal, that it's going to favor the rich, that on top of that, the poor are going to pay for the political preferences of the rich and that this influence uh, the uh, results of the election. The last thing people want to hear after that is that we should spend more public money to fund democracy. And in fact, if you observe what has happening historically, in particular in Italy uh, in recent years, or in the United States with the huge turn that took place at the time of uh, Obama's first election in 2008, what we have observed is in, in the ending of the public funding of democracy. And this ending of the public funding of democracy can just worsen, in fact, the crisis of representation. What I think we should do is the following. First of all, I think we should push for a drastic limit on private donations. And I think we should limit private donations to 200 euros or dollars per year and per, and, 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 and per voter. The second thing we should do, because remember, democracy has a cost, we should find a new way to fund democracy. And the best way to fund democracy is through public funding that is going to give each citizen the same voice. 
This is what I called the democratic equality voters. And the idea behind these democratic equality voters is that each year, each citizen can choose to allocate an equal amount to the political movement of her choice. Okay. So you take all the money that is spent today to publicly fund democracies in countries where you have public funding, like France and Spain, in countries where you no longer have public funding, like Italy or the US you, or the UK, because the UK, you, you have never had any public funding of democracy, you introduce public funding of democracy. You take the amount, you split it between each citizen, and you give citizens this opportunity to allocate and to fund the political party of their choice. And I think it will have a lot of positive consequences. One of these consequences would also be to rebuild trust between citizens and political parties. I, I was telling you at the very beginning, you know, I, I now I'm just summarizing everything, but I, 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 I tried to build on history and on international experiences in this, in this book. And so this idea of democratic equality voters, it does not came out of nowhere. In fact, it drew on international experiences and in particular on the experience and the collapse of the presidential fund uh, in the US and of the way public funding uh, work in Italy, okay. It also drew on something that is working well in the US since 2017, which is uh, which are the Seattle democracy vouchers. Okay, the Seattle democracy vouchers is something that was decided at the level of Seattle in the U.S. Given in the U.S., you know, each time uh, government this year have been willing to do something to regulate money in politics at the federal level, it has been made super difficult by the Supreme Court, and I'm afraid it might not change uh, in the near future. So Seattle has decided to act on its own, and what they say since 2017. They sent every year, no, they sent at the time of every local election for $25 vouchers to all the voters that the voters can allocate uh, to the candidate of uh, their choice. And if the candidate accepts this public funding through the voters, then he say, okay, I'm not going to accept any private money. It's working well. It's not working perfectly because what did we saw? The first time it was okay. And then the second time, all the big firms, Amazon to begin with, decided to fill the elections in Seattle with a lot of private money so that those candidates still relying on private money were able to make much better than those receiving the uh, democracy vouchers. Okay. So it means that anyway, we need to find new way to publicly fund democracy, but we also need to find the way to regulate how much money can be spent uh, by large donors or by a corporation. This idea, you know, of democratic equality vouchers, it's also rely on a number of existing proposals. Uh, some before my book, now you have other, like after I publish the book, and I'm very happy that this is part of the public debate, uh, in particular in the, in the US, the very first one, in fact, was uh, written uh, in a very precise way on, on this topic was uh, Larry Lessig in the Republic uh, Lost. They were in December 2018, Democracy Dollars Act uh, introduced by uh, Rokana uh, in the US. And uh, in the last report of the Harvard Law School, Clean State for Worker Power, they also defend this idea of a federal democracy voucher uh, program. Uh, and so we really need to publicly fund campaign. I think we really need also to publicly fund political parties because we need political parties uh, in democratic systems. And we need to make it impossible for candidates to choose public, between public and between uh, private fundings. The last thing I want to highlight. Five minutes. Important... Yeah, well, perfect. This is the last slide. I guess I would be on time. It's the, it the importance of uh, having a better representation of the working class in politics. So, you know, yesterday we had this uh, discussion with Hélène Landemort. We talked about like what happened in France uh, with the Convention Citoyenne uh, around the issues of the climate. And there is all the work uh, that is done by uh, Isabel Ferreras, also about the representation of uh, the workers uh, within firms. Uh, I, do, I do think that we need to find a way to ensure 
a better representation of the working class into politics. I'm just drawing you here like one plot. I have plenty of plot uh, on France. Uh, we also have a lot of evidence uh, on the US uh, about the fact that the share of the working class among MPs in the US, in the UK, in France, in Germany, this is true in a lot of countries, uh, has collapsed, completely collapsed over time. And if we do not do anything, it's, it's not going to, 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 to change, you know, uh, alone. We really need to, to do things uh, to do to do things the, about that. Uh, what can we do about that? One possibility is to say, okay, at the end of the day, elections do not work because if we do have elections, we do have this result. So this is better to rely uh, on luck. Okay, let's draw citizens and have these uh, representative citizens like we have with the Convention Citoyenne. Uh, that are going to represent the rest of the citizens. And they will be representative in terms of descriptive terms. Uh, and this is where I, 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 I do not agree uh, with people who defend this, uh, this idea, even if we do agree on the what is the final objective of what we want to do. What we want to do is to have a better representation of the working class. Okay, that we do agree. I still do believe in elections, and I still do believe that we can get the same results still using the electoral system. But if we want to have the same results still using the electoral system, we need to do for the working class what we have done in a number of countries uh, for women during the past decades. The only reason why you have much more women today in politics than in the past is not like a simple change in mentality that happened from one day to the other is because of the introduction of gender parity. And the fact that we have changed in the law and introduced an obligation for the political parties to present a certain share of women in some elections. And I think we should do exactly the same with the working class. And we can push this idea of telling like, if you are a political party and you want to present candidates at general elections, you can do so only if half of your candidates come from the working class. And if among your, your uh, elected representative, you do not have between, let's say, 40 and 60% of working class MPs, then you will have to pay a huge fine, or you will no longer be able to present candidate at next election. And I think for that, and I, I know that I'm jumping a little bit from the funding of like democracy, to this idea of representation, but still, I think it's important to also talk about like a real representation of the working class per se. Uh, we can be radical, we need to be radical. And I think that the mixed assembly can be part of uh, the solution and of uh, what we can, uh, we can do. So I am, I, am, I am done here. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Julia. We can now... Uh, uh, ask questions so please uh, raise your digital hands so that uh... Roberto please Hi, Julia fascinating talk absolutely brilliant and I'm Italian so I am particularly sensitive to the topic uh, for the reasons you mentioned so I, so I have uh, um, a comment and a question. The comment is, I think that the best way of showing the importance of public funding is two dates. So 1993 is when a referendum was passed in Italy to eliminate public financing of political parties. And 1994, one year later, is when Berlusconi won the elections for the first time. And I don't think there is no relation between the two. My question is in slightly different. The two per thousand system that you mentioned in Italy is arguably extremely similar to the voucher system you have. So for those who don't know what the two per thousand is, is basically you can pay two per thousand point two percent of your uh, uh, tax income, uh, you can just devote it. So it's not an additional tax, it's something that you can devote to a specific political party. So the only significant difference with the voucher system is that 
uh, of course, richer people will be able to give more because they have higher income and possibly paying higher taxation. But to a very large extent, exa is exactly the same as you're proposing. You have a certain amount of money that you can allocate to different parties. Why? So, and, and it's not really effective, to be honest, because people just forget, they don't decide to allocate, they have no idea, or they're just prejudiced against political parties. So I, I wonder why you're not just suggesting straight public funding, say, uh, either reimbursing at least partly certain types of electoral expenses or uh, the functioning of parties more directly. So the public says, okay, democracy costs X, I'm gonna give you X and that's it. And then ban on public finance. Sorry, private finance. <laughs> So I have a full chapter in the book about Italy uh, and about the Due Per Mille and about all the history of the public funding in Italy. And in fact, there are like really like the, the, the two main uh, countries that inspired what I do in my book. At the end of the day, I, the US with all the story of the presidential fund in 1974 and how we moved from the 71-74 reforms to today's situation and the Italian case. Uh, and the Italian case, basically I said, they, they got the good intuition with this idea of having these like uh, vouchers, the due per mille, uh, but they did it in a stupid way, if I can, uh, because it's really the, the, the best example of an unfair and completely regressive system. Uh, the, 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 the more money you have, the, the more public fund you will be able to, to allocate. Uh, it turns out that this system has been uh, implemented first by the Partito Democratico, and at the time it was Enrico Letta. Enrico Letta worked for a couple of years at Sciences Po, and we, uh, we, we, we talked together about that. And, and I really asked him, why did you do it with the due per mille, rather than giving like every Italian five, five or ten euros? And the, and the answer he gave me was super interesting, by, by the way, was to say, the only thing that is working well today in Italy, on which everybody agree, is the auto per mille, the funding of, of like the religion. And so we said that we need to find a way to do something that people will accept. And if we do the same thing that the auto per mille, people will accept it. Uh, at the end of the day, there are a number of reasons why it does not work. First, it's super, it's not done super properly. It's complicated. Uh, you have a list like of a 20 page, you know, with code for political parties that you can just find online. But also the main reason is basically they decide ex ante in, in the law how much money can be uh, allocated uh, before. So basically they put a cap on how much money they will spend on that. Uh, and, and so this is a, a way to completely, in fact, it does not link the effort that citizens are going to be made to how much the political parties are going to receive. Then I, I, your su suggestion, why don't we decide uh, ex ante what to do with uh, 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 how much we want to spend and then pay back the political parties? I think we need to be more transparent and the Italian history uh, teaches us uh, why. In Italy, the public funding of democracy was introduced in 1974 with two things, direct public funding of parties and reimbursement of campaign costs. Uh, well, I'm going to do a short story. But short story uh, was with, at the beginning of the 1990s, uh, with the Mani Pulite scandal and the collapse of the First Republic, they were a popular referendum against uh, the public funding of parties and people voted for the end of the public funding of parties. Uh, in fact, if I, if I move back to my slide for one second, because I think it's, it's pretty nice, but we see what happened on this plot. So it was there in 1974, people voted for the end of uh, 1984 for the end of the public funding of party, okay? No more direct public funding, but they were still the public reimbursement of campaign costs. And then you might wonder, why do we see that? This increase back, okay? Because the Italian MPs, what did they do? They decided in the law to change the rule for public reimbursement of campaign costs. And basically they say, you no longer need to spend something during a campaign, to have your campaign expenditures reimbursed. <laughs> and basically this was a way for them to get the exact same amount they were getting before through the direct public funding, through the reimbursement of their campaign cost. And so it increased like over time. And then they, they, they were all the campaign done by the uh, 50 uh, Estrella movement and everything against uh, even reimbursement. And in uh, 2014, you have the end of, uh, they, they voted for the end of the public reimbursement. 
What I mean here is that when you have such a distrust in political parties and in the way they are funded, and that this distrust is, is, is partly deserved, if, if, if I can, uh, because what was done in the 1990s by the Italian politicians was not really not a fair way uh, to deal with the citizens' vote. Uh, I really think the best way to, to do it and at the end of the day is to make it much more transparent by giving the same amount to all the citizens. Uh, and this is where the, we can do the, the democratic voucher. What I like with the Due Per Mille in Italy is that it, 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 it really shows us that it works. When I, I told people in France for the democratic voucher, a lot of them say, oh, but this will be too complicated for the tax administration. This is not the, no, but look, we do have an example, Italy. It works well. The tax administration know how to do that. So the French tax administration and the British one and German one should also be able to do the same, uh, the same job. Thank you, Julia, for, uh, for this uh, answer. Max is going to ask the next question. Please be brief yeah. because uh, we are running out. Yeah, of, of time. course, of course. Um, I'll ask a small question, a slightly bigger one. The small one is for the purpose of your mixed assemblies proposal for the working class quotas. How would you define working class? Um, and then the second question, slightly bigger one, is for the the various trends that you identify um, in in representation. To what extent do you think it's just a story about the money flows that you focus on? And to what extent do you think there's also this other story that Peter Mayer identified in, in his book, Ruling the Void, about the social disembedding of the political parties? Where do you see the relative weight of these two stories? I think the, 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 the both stories are, are at play. And the third story is also the, the, the issue of the, the change in the characteristics uh, of the voters who are going to vote for the different parties. So I'm not claiming that I'm explaining everything with this uh, idea of uh, funding of parties, but I think it plays uh, an important role and that we, we need to have that in mind. Uh, by, we, by, by the way, it's, it's why I'm finishing on the mixed assembly. Because I think that even if we were like just solving this issue of funding of democracy, we will still have a number of problems that we need to uh, to solve. But we we also need to 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 solve this uh, this part. Um, on the uh, defining uh, working class, the, we we have a, a number of different ways uh, of doing it, uh, which varies from one country to the other. In fact, if you look at the census in different countries in general, uh, you have like a number of categories that you can then use uh, to define the, who is a blue collar, who is a white collar worker. One way that we might also be willing to use rather than this definition working class, uh, blue collar versus white collar is just to, to rely on income, which in a sense would be like a simpler way to uh, implement that. But then if you talk about income, that will be the issue of wealth so it's it's not easy to be implemented but you we if we were serious enough to do it i think then and this would be done at the country level it would be uh, not so complicated to define the exact rules uh, in india for example with the scheduled tribes uh, it has been done uh, but, but using this uh, indian context and we can use the specificity of the uk context uh, french context german context to uh, pick the definition which uh, will sound the best uh, uh, yes, for, uh, for a given context. Helene is the next one. Yes, uh, Julia, I love the paper. Uh, I, and as we said yesterday uh, with Isabel, we, you know, we should be open to pragmatism and experimentation. So it's very likely that your sort of hybrid uh, you know, model is, is a lot more feasible than, for example, my open democracy model. But I want to press you on the principles because on the theory, if you want, because I, I still don't understand what you see so valuable. Uh, it, it's so valuable about elections if your goal is equal representation. If your goal is equal representation or something closer to that, uh, I think you know a lottery-based system is a lot more eff efficacious. You get everyone represented in proportion of, of their numbers, and so it's not just about the working class, which is singled out for some historical reason here. But you know, it, it's about the youth, it's about the vegetarians, it's about the religious people, it's about the artists who never run for elections, it's about the silent, the, the people who are not charismatic. So why are those all excluded from, from a model where you, you don't have a sort of category for them? And I think sortition is a much cheaper way to a less um, clunky way to get to that sort of goal. So what I take from your presentation is that you care about another value that you're willing to trade off, which is um, the, the value of party and the kind of like deliberation that goes on in parties and the kind of ideology you can develop 
within parties. But what I want to propose is that you don't need elections to have the equivalent of parties. You could have a, 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 an open democracy type with, where there are only pure, you know, pure random selection to staff assemblies that are agenda setting or legislative, but you would still have these big think tanks, these big party-like machines that provide intellectual platforms and ideas for the debates that surround moments of referenda, for example, and that would try to influence the deliberations going on in the, the assemblies. So money would still play a role, you would still have huge biases, so we'd have to think about how, ways to fix it. But the beauty of the pure selection model is that at least in terms of who has power, you'd have this really important filter where everybody's re represented equally or as, you know, as equally as possible. Yeah, so but you, yesterday you took the example of uh, France that you know pretty well. At the end of the day, in, in the, the French experience, you had 150 persons who took advantage of it. You had 150 persons uh, who were debating about the questions okay, for make a thousand, Make it a thousand, make it a thousand. It compels no, with the parliament. So, but we have 16 million uh, citizens in France, out of which 14 million today are allowed to go to the pool and vote. That's not and the comparison point. Need... The comparison point is the parliament. I, no, that's not true. What is important for me is election. I want election because okay, I think that's that the election. referenda part. In no. my model, the uh, referenda. Excuse me, Elena. We are we are running out of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. But we will <laughs> never finish this discussion with Elena. No, oh, I never. <laughs> that's nice. Okay. So uh, Francois is going to ask uh, the last question, but uh, I would um, uh, like to stress uh, for Julia that uh, in the chat, there are a number of uh, questions and it would be very nice if after uh, this um, last question uh, in the break, uh, you could have uh, some time to, to reply to them. So Francois, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm not at all very, uh, I mean, I'm not at all an expert in the literature, but I remember of an argument against putting uh, upper bound on the uh, campaign expenditures, which is that those upper bounds are uh, favoring the incumbents and the incumbents advantage can be a problem, especially if we speak of the representation, uh, uh, I mean, crisis. So I was wondering whether, uh, I mean, you have, you have looked at that and, uh, my intuition being that, uh, uh, I mean, the, the system that you are promoting seems to me to exacerbate that and to give a, a fantastic advantage of uh, incumbent and, and fantastic difficulty for completely newcomers to, I mean, to show up and to be known. Except if uh, you have enough public uh, funding uh, for the campaign expenditures and you, if you, just say that we were able to quantify exactly this incumbent advantage. We know that it exists. I think it's hard to quantify it, but we were able to quantify it in uh, uh, monetary terms or in terms of uh, what advantage it gives you to be an incumbent. Then you can uh, say that uh, for the incumbent, you will have a little bit less public funding than for all the other candidates who are running against uh, against the incumbent. Uh, the, the idea is not just to cap if you just cap donations, obviously it would be a big issue for uh, the, the, the people who are going to run against the incumbent. Here is to cap donations and to have public fund for the campaigns. Uh, I think the public fund for the campaigns is a way to equalize uh, the, 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 the winning chance of all the candidates. But if we think that the new candidates come can suffer from this incumbency advantage, we can also decide collectively uh, to give them an extra uh, public funding to compensate for this uh, disadvantage. Okay, thank you very much. These uh, were uh, convincing answers. So thank you, uh, uh, Julie, again. And uh, we are going to resume at 11 o'clock. See you in uh, 10 minutes. And will you try to answer a couple of these questions, Julia, in the chat? Yes, I will. Uh, let me. Open. Ah, OK, I, I will uh, first answer the, 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 the question by uh, Moritz on uh, why, uh, why the list has not put forward more working class candidates in elections. Uh, in fact, you have, you have uh, some political scientists uh, that work on this issue, whether uh, citizens, people do prefer uh, working class candidates or whether they uh, do prefer 
uh, let's say white collar candidates uh, because I don't know they think that they are more serious or like better educated or or, or whatever. Uh, in particular, and I forgot his name. I remember the name of his uh, book uh, on uh, white collar democracy. You have these political scientists who have run a number of surveys. When you you have exactly like similar candidates with like same characteristics in terms of uh, uh, origins, uh, uh, how they look like, etc. And then you you just have their job that is going to differ. And when you perform. Uh, Nicola Carnes, sorry, the name of the researcher who did this uh, study. And what Nick Carnes showed is that when you perform this kind of uh, surveys, at the end of the day, you do find uh, that people, if anything, do prefer uh, working class candidates because they consider that they, they look more like them. Uh, so I, 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 I see research suggests not having working class candidates earn them electorally, yes, de facto. Uh, or, there are not a lot of research on that, but the research that I know that has been done, for example, by Nick Carnes, really suggests that this is not uh, a good choice. Now, if you look at the, 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 the plot I show you for the UK, it's a very interesting plot in terms of uh, timing uh, for the Labour Party. Uh, the real shift for the Labour Party took place at the end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, and can be linked uh, to one of Margaret Thatcher's decisions, uh, who made it much more complicated for the unions in the UK to fund the political parties and to fund in particular uh, the Labour Party. If you not only look at this plot with the share of working class MPs, but you look at the same time at the plot when you look at the share of the total funding of the Labour Party uh, that comes from the unions and the share of the total funding of the uh, Labour Party that comes uh, from private donors, you really seeing the exact uh, same inverse uh, trend. Uh, the, the more private funding of the Labour Party, the, uh, the, 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 the less uh, the number of working class MPs uh, in the UK. Uh, and this effect, you, you see it uh, in, in, uh, through two different lens. The first one is that, and this is something that has been well documented in the UK, uh, when you give a lot of money to a political party, uh, and then when you also fund your own campaign, but when you ask as a donor for a party, you have a much higher probability uh, to be picked uh, by the party to run in the constituency. So you have this uh, direct, it can, could also be called like a quid pro quo uh, in, in a sense effect. And the second one is when we do this survey where we say that it hurts uh, electorally the Labour Party not to have working class uh, candidates, that's true if you look at the general population. Now, if what you are interested in is not to please the overall population, but to please the funders, then the donors might be uh, more willing to have uh, candidates looking like them. And these candidates who look like them uh, are not uh, working class candidates. Uh, for the, the, the small donor matching funds, uh, I think it's a good, uh, it's a very good idea. In fact, this is a, the, the very last thing that we still have in the US uh, in terms of public funding of democracy, uh, a little bit, very little bit at the, at the federal system uh, at the time of uh, the primaries, uh, but this is implemented more and more uh, by some state, uh, is to say that a way to publicly fund democracy would be to match uh, the donations that are made, but obviously you are not going to match uh, the very large donations, so you do that for small donations. And also, uh, like today, I was pretty like uh, pessimistic in my way to present US politics, uh, another good thing that is like slowly improving over time is the apparition of like new technologies uh, such as AgBlue. Uh, so AgBlue is, is just a map on the phone. Uh, it was introduced in 2014, uh, no, in 2004, in fact, by the Democratic Party, but it's just like increased very uh, strongly in, uh, in recent years. And with AgBlue, in fact, what you see is a huge increase uh, in the number of small donors, in the number of small donations. So obviously these donations are small, but the more and more and more donors, uh, like the equilibrium between large donors and small donors is slowly changing over time. The thing is, if on top of that, you do not cap the large donations, you will always find a Koch brother uh, to give at some point, you know, $1 billion and then you completely kill all the effort. But it's nice to see that from time to time, technology can help and the technology like uh, AgBlue was a way to uh, improve. Uh, this uh, this uh, share of small donors uh, compared 
compared to the large one. And what was of interest is that in the 2016 primary, at the end of the day, Bernie Sanders uh, was able to raise more money during the primaries uh, through the small donation than Hillary Clinton through the large donors. Uh, so, you know, like uh, so from time to time, the, the majority can make a difference in a, uh, in a way. Uh, regarding professional politicians, so I, I did not enter in, in, into that, uh, but I think that one of the things we need to think about at, at, at some point, uh, it's also to have a limited number of terms uh, over time. Uh, the, the fact of having uh, more than the possibility to run more than twice or to be elected more than twice uh, for a given election, it's part of the problem because of these professional politicians. And in fact, this is the entire uh, history of the sociology of political parties uh, since the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, this idea of saying that even if you are like a blue collar worker uh, and uh, uh, you, you become member of the Social Democrat Party, uh, in Germany, at the end of the day, you are going to uh, behave as if uh, you were a petit bourgeois or a white collar worker uh, because you, you became a, a professional uh, politician. Uh, and I think the only way to solve that is to limit uh, the number of times you can be elected for, uh, for the same position. This has been done for things like president, but this is more to uh, try to uh, avoid the risk of a dictatorship. But I think we should also do that for mayor. We should do that for MPs. Uh, to be sure to have like uh, enough like new citizens involved in politics on a regular basis rather than always the same uh, the same different uh, guys and okay well uh, so the, the I'm, I'm reading the comment by Aline Seward uh, on saying that limiting contribution by individuals mean limiting the right to political expression and free expression of political opinions uh, I do not agree with that. Uh, I have to say that the Supreme Court in the US uh, did not agree with that uh, until the 1980s, uh, and that the First Amendment is still the same uh, today uh, as it was uh, at the time of the US uh, Constitution. Uh, for me, it's uh, hard to believe and to buy the idea according to which uh, money is a speech. I do not believe that money is speech, and I uh, do not believe that corporations should be considered uh, as individuals are uh, when uh, we talk uh, about free speech. Uh, I know this is part of the debate uh, in the US. I think this still have to be considered as a, as a debate. Again, huh? in the US at the time of the introduction of the presidential fund, uh, presidential fund in 1974, uh, like the first regulation passed in 1971 was to limit uh, how much uh, corporations, first of all, corporations were not allowed, and how much individuals uh, could uh, give to political campaigns, including at the beginning their own political campaigns. But this was uh, quickly, uh, quickly modified. Uh, then we can discuss for hours uh, why uh, I do not think that uh, money is speech. Uh, but I guess uh, someone do that much better than I, uh, which is Darryl Lessig in his in Republic Lost and his uh, follow-up books. He, he, and he does that as a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so I'm more talking to tell that to you as a citizen. Uh, but I think that uh, Larry Lessig as a lawyer and as a constitutionalist, uh, we know very well the US Constitution has a pretty strong argument uh, against uh, this uh, view. Uh, that impede, uh, unfortunately, any regulation of campaign finance, finance in the US as of, uh, as of today. And I guess I'm, yeah, I'm basically done with the question in the, in the chat. Are you done with the break? Yeah, so. Can I ask another question then, Julia? Yeah? yeah. Um, so, you know, often when, when uh, people object to um, the, the, the random We should start with the next talk. Oh, okay, sorry. Well, Maybe uh, you can send the, can yeah, write it in the, the chat. In the chat, yeah, yeah. It's, it's about um, loss of uh, competence and, and quick rotation of rulers. Okay, so uh, welcome again, uh, everybody. We are going to start with the second talk of today. Uh, Francois Maniquet from uh, Catholic University of Louvain, La Neuve, is going to talk about fair inheritance taxation.
Um, I guess you don't. We are not seeing your slides. No, yet. I, uh, I realize that. Um, um, you have to click on the on the green button uh, to share to give the possibility of sharing. Yes, I have a security question here. So in the chat there is the password uh, socialism. 2021. Well, that, that's just for the conference papers. It shouldn't be needed for sharing the screen. What, what does it say? I need to authorize some app to register the contents of my screen. The first time that I get that. And what happens if you authorize? I, I, I need to choose something, but I have a long list or Zoom or. Yeah, if you have Zoom in the list, it's probably Zoom also. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, I'm asked to quit the meeting and come back. Sorry about that. Okay. Because uh, he, has a, he has a Mac, it often happens with Mac. So I don't know whether Helene wanted to uh, ask uh, oh, Julia oh, yeah, actually, a question. Yeah, I? Uh, but, but <laughs> I guess she replied, the, actually. I think this with, could be interesting. So with I, the I risk of ask, being uh, stopped. Yeah, yeah, cut me off anytime. Uh, so Julia, I wanted to ask you so publicly, I think it's of interest. Um, if we limit mandates, then we lose incompetence, or so the critics say, because I have the same problem with uh, you know, lots of critical representatives, and they become uh, easily captured by powerful administration agencies, lobbies. So what do you say to that? So, first of all, it has never, never been proved, uh, and I would like to see empirical evidence uh, that uh, you have more uh, captured by vested interest uh, for uh, first-term politicians than for repeated politicians. Uh, and as long as I, I, uh, no, no one is going to show me this evidence, I, I won't buy the, the argument. Uh, the second thing is that a lot of people are going to tell you that it's the contrary, like uh, what creates uh, increase the weight of lobbying is just the fact that after like five, six, seven, eight, ten years, 15 years, you're just used to have, uh, you know, lunch, coffee, dinner with all the lobbyists. And so you are going to be more willing to accept uh, uh, things that at the beginning, you know, of your term, you were like super like careful about it. And the last thing, it, it means that we need to regulate lobbying. And I think this is also the, the best answer. If we have an issue with lobbying, the solution is not to say, let's do 10 different mandates. The solution is to regulate lobbying. And uh, I'm not saying this is easy, but I think this should be part of this uh, of the discussion. OK, oh, thank you very me. much. It seems that uh, we are uh, that Francois has uh, solved the, the problem, the technical problem. So he can start now. OK, do you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Uh, but it's not in full, I guess. It's, it looks Almost. full. Oh, yeah. it is in full screen? Yes. Okay, good. So, uh, uh, I mean, all my apologies for, uh, for this delay. So, uh, thanks a lot, uh, um, I mean, John, for organizing this conference and uh, having me on the program. 
So uh, I'm going to talk <clears throat> about fair in inheritance taxation a paper with uh, Benoit de Serre, whom I think is in the in the room. Uh, okay, so I, I'm afraid it's going to be a little bit more technical than the, uh, the other talks, but I will try to make it as uh, uh, little, uh, I mean, technical as possible. So, uh, I mean, let me begin with this absolutely um, clear motivation that uh, inheritance is a major channel of wealth accumulation and therefore of wealth inequality. And I don't need in this uh, conference to uh, insist on the, the reason to worry about wealth uh, inequality. So the paper uh, deal with the, deals with the question, uh, can we justify to tax bequests based on fairness principles? And if so, how should we tax uh, bequests? Uh, where fairness means, and I was uh, most than happy to hear Suresh introducing this uh, yesterday. So fairness principles in the, the, uh, the sense I'm gonna use them here, means the socialist view on equality of opportunity. So more precisely, uh, uh, this is inspired by the so-called theories of responsibility for egalitarian planners as introduced uh, in the literature by John. And um, uh, I mean, this paper will, will be closer to the version uh, developed by, uh, uh, by Mark. So uh, let me begin with a little bit of uh, uh, background about uh, what we know from the literature about uh, bequest taxation. And I think that doing this, uh, it is fair to say that there is a, a before and an after a paper by uh, uh, Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Saez, recently published in Econometrica. So, uh, I mean, before that paper, I think that the two main arguments that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, are in the literature and that uh, are really shaping the, the wisdom about uh, bequest taxation uh, are those two arguments. So first it is a Atkinson Stiglitz type of argument, right? saying that uh, you know, bequest taxation is just uh, a useless complement to labor income taxation if the objective is to redistribute from uh, high productivity individuals to low productivity individuals, how much the uh, bequest does not teach us anything and you know, any vector of utility can be uh, reached uh, using labor income taxation alone. So a strong argument against taxing bequest and there is even a main argument in favor of subsidizing bequest, which is based on externalities of bequest uh, from parents to children, uh, to the extent that laissez-faire would uh, lead to an under provision of uh, subsidies, and so we should, uh, sorry, of, uh, of bequest, and you know, a, a PIGU uh, kind of uh, uh, subsidy can be uh, optimal. So those are really uh, two main and very influential uh, arguments before uh, the Piketty size paper. And what is important to keep in mind is that the typical, I mean, the assumptions that are, so, so to speak, needed, or I, at least that I use to reach those uh, conclusions, those arguments, is that individuals are either parents and children, right? So, I mean, uh, so this created, I mean, asymmetry between two types of agents. And I'm going to say in a minute why this is important. The typical assumption is also that of identical uh, preferences so that uh, a larger bequest only reveals a larger ability to earn income. And uh, this inequality in ability to earn income is the main uh, driver of uh, uh, taxation. Okay. Uh, of course, there are other uh, questions, other arguments presented in the, in the literature, but those two ones are the main ones that uh, I'm going to discuss and that are, uh, I mean, relevant for, uh, for this paper. And so this is this, I mean, wisdom that has been completely uh, uh, shaken by uh, uh, Piketty uh, and Saez. Their main assumptions are this. So they keep the assumption, the assumption of differences in ability to earn income but they add the following two assumptions. So first they look at, so I mean, they develop a model of successive generations, which means that each and every individual is a child and a parent in turn, which, I mean, changed the picture quite drastically because uh, taxing the income of parent uh, to, to subsidize uh, children will have 
long run effect because those children, when they are parents, will also have to uh, pay uh, that tax on their own income. Uh, and this, this, I mean, fundamental uh, consequence of uh, a tax system, uh, a bequest tax system, is not at all uh, captured by the by the previous uh, papers. And also, and, and also very importantly, is the assumption of heterogeneous preferences, especially heterogeneity in the way uh, uh, parents treat their children, with the consequence that uh, taxing bequest is not only a way of redistributing from high ability to low ability, but also a way to redistribute from lucky to unlucky children. And the unlucky children are those who have uh, non-altruistic parents. And moreover, I mean, the, the objective of taking this externality of bequest into account is lower because the externality of bequest is reflected in the level of sustainable uh, tax and uh, transfer policies because of the uh, long run effect of uh, taxing uh, incomes. With uh, the, 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 main, the following main theoretical result, I mean, they do much more than that in the paper, but in terms of, of theory, what they show is that depending on social preferences, which means depending on the, so the weights that the social planner assigns to different types of agents, taxing bequest may become uh, optimal. You see, so it is, uh, I mean, basically in the same kind of model as uh, the ones that I mentioned before, but by putting them in a successive generation framework and allowing heterogeneity in preferences completely changes uh, the, uh, the outcome and, and the result. So what we do is in paper, in this paper is precisely and maybe modestly uh, raise a question about uh, how should we define those social preferences? How should we assign weights to different uh, people? And what we show is that fairness in the uh, way that I uh, mentioned uh, before implies not that bequest could be taxed, but that bequest should be taxed. And we show in the paper uh, how, which means that it gives uh, some properties of the optimal uh, tax uh, uh, scheme. So in order to reach this uh, conclusion, we build a social welfare function. And we build this social welfare function based on okay, efficiency, but on the following two uh, <coughs> uh, I mean, fairness principles that are inspired by the theories of equality of opportunity. So the first principle, which we call responsibility, captures this idea that parents should be free to allocate their wealth. To put it differently, it means that the tax system should not treat parents, so should not treat individuals differently <clears throat> on the simple basis of differences in their preferences, that is differences in the way they treat their uh, children. And on the other hand, and that's uh, what we call in this uh, frame compensation, we also capture the idea that children should not be hit by the lack of altruism of their parents. We believe that those two, uh, I mean, principles are, are really, uh, I mean, do shape the debates about um, the possibility or not to tax bequest. And you see, I mean, it is pretty obvious that the responsibility principles seem to go against uh, taxing bequest. The compensation seems to be in favor of taxing bequest. And so, the, I mean, the main lesson is that when you combine the two, still you obtain the conclusion that bequest should be taxed. And uh, uh, I mean, we have an auxiliary uh, condition well done in welfare economics. So we studied the trade-off between a demogrant and, uh, uh, and, and bequest taxation that can be non-linear. And as you will uh, see in a minute, the, a positive demogrant means indeed that we tax bequest in order to be able to uh, increase the lifetime income of everybody. And a negative uh, demogrant means that the uh, redistribution goes the other way around and we have to tax uh, the lifetime incomes of the people in order to uh, on average subsidize bequests and so we show that a, a positive demogrant is uh, optimal. So uh, that's the first result uh, but, but there is a second result which is that when we look at the shape of the optimal uh, tax scheme, it turns out that one tax scheme is, I mean, looks pretty prominent 
and it is a tax scheme that consists in exempting from tax uh, all bequests between zero and a given level, and this level corresponding to the level of bequest left by the most altruistic parent who uh, themselves did not receive anything uh, from their own parents, so did not receive anything uh, from, uh, from uh, I mean, as a child, right? So exemption between zero and this amount, and after that, tax as much as is compatible with sustainability. So this is a prominent tax scheme. We know that it is not optimal in all cases, and we have also proven that when it is not optimal, uh, uh, taxes still in, uh, I mean, uh, bequest in this interval may be taxed, but in case they are taxed, taxes are uh, limited, and we, uh, I mean, I mean, and we are more precise about that. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, I mean, a preview of uh, the result and uh, the way towards this result. So maybe that's uh, uh, time to uh, see whether there are uh, questions. Okay, so uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't see questions. So let me introduce the, the, the model. So just maybe for clarification. So, um, sure. so what, what are the instruments of the planner? In, 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 so is, the, is there also an endogenous labor supply? So like in the Piketty size paper? Uh, okay, yes. Uh, the, the answer is no. Right, so I mean, uh, we assume uh, lifetime income to be fixed and equal among all agents. And this is not a very key assumption. I will uh, explain at the end how we can uh, relax that uh, reasonably easily. And uh, uh, Joachim has a, a question. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the three desiderata, uh, the first and the third look uh, uh, pretty compelling. Are you not sure about the second? Uh, uh, once the person is dead, then uh, he doesn't have any wealth. Uh, so the, uh, I, I know that that that, that raises a, 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 a large issue of, of problems. So what the, what's the tax on on uh, inter inheritance versus uh, donations inter vivos? But uh, but I don't see the the second. A point as compelling as the, the one and the third. I see. So uh, first, uh, what should be clear is that we are we are not dealing with accidental bequest. Huh? So we are really dealing with. Uh, so to the extent that it is perfectly uh, substitute to uh, uh, donation uh, intra vivos, uh -huh. and so I mean what these principles say is that uh, I mean the tax system should not for example, penalize the parents who are extremely uh, generous towards those, uh, um, I mean, their children and should not penalize the other uh, either. And so this is the idea of uh, uh, not having a tax system that is based on the preferences uh, of the uh, agents, but on their ability to uh, make donations or to let uh, bequests. But okay, those are principles. I mean, uh, whether they are compelling or not, um, maybe we will I mean, it would be hard to agree on that, but but at, at least I do believe that it is. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I believe that in the debate about uh, taxing bequest or not, one argument is that I mean, why should we? Uh, I mean, go against the will of the uh, of the people, and this is what this uh, uh, preference, what this uh, principle is is capturing. So I think that it's, uh, I mean, I would like to go a little bit uh, into the, I mean, a little bit more precisely into, into the model. So as a consequence of, uh, uh, I mean, the answer to Giacomo's question, this is a model of with two goods. Huh? So, I mean, uh, we assume away the questions related to uh, labor supply. So there are two goods, consumption and age. What is age? Age is the net of tax inheritance that is left to their children. Okay, so we assume this sort of, I mean, uh, joy of giving uh, uh, altruism, which means that parents do not care of the total wealth of their parents. They do not care about the, uti sorry, parents do not care about the total wealth of their children. They do not care about utility of their children. They do care about how much children receive from, uh, from their own uh, donation after, I mean, through the taxation system, okay? So we assume that, 
everybody, I mean, all agents have the same lifetime income, which is a way of assuming away questions related to how to tax uh, labor income, etc. And the W is common to everybody. So, which means at the time T, the people have this W plus what the government gives them, which is capital DT. I have represented here with a positive DT. It can be zero, it can be negative. That's precisely one of the main questions uh, we address. Then agent IT, moreover, receives uh, something from their parents through the tax system, which is GIT. And the total is the income or the total wealth of uh, this agent. Then there is the tax system, which uh, is tau uh, at time t. And this, the way uh, bequests are taxed, give a sudden best, let's say, budget to uh, the agent, and the agent maximizes over that budget. And this is how they uh, specify their own consumption and, the, uh, of course, their bequest and the quantity that they let to their uh, children. And then at the next, uh, at t plus one, uh, uh, the, uh, the g of the uh, generation at t plus one is determined by those uh, age and the world uh, continues. Okay, so that's that's the uh, I mean that's the model that uh, uh, that we treat. So this is the definition more formally of uh, this model. So nothing really new. Let me simply add that uh, a, a, a particularly important role will be played by two uh, different uh, uh, I mean uh, preference relations the most altruistic uh, ones and the least alt altruistic ones, that is those who are self-centered. Huh? Utility of those guys only depend on their own consumption. Okay, so there is an intergenerational interest rate, uh, capital R. And uh, uh, what, we, what is important is that, so social preferences will be defined over one generation allocation. Okay, so, uh, I mean, we do not rank flows of intergenerational uh, allocations. We rank uh, one generation allocations and the generation specifies for each agent uh, uh, what he or she gets from their own parents' consumption and what they let uh, to their children. And this is the way it is, uh, uh, I mean, the relationship between uh, generations. And we restrict our attention to steady, st steady state allocations in which the distribution of what, uh, uh, I mean, the distribution of what uh, agents uh, let is constant uh, over time. Okay. So this is the, uh, the model. Let me now go, go, go back to the uh, fairness principles. So the first one, and tries to capture the idea that parents should be free to allocate their wealth the way they wish, so to choose freely their level of consumption and what they let to their uh, children. How do we capture that? So think of two agents, JT and KT, that have the same, received exactly the same amount from their parents, right? So that means that they have the same, uh, 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 I mean, th that they are identical, uh, in uh, everything, but possibly their preferences, right? And so assume that they face non-distorted budget, but yet the, uh, uh, I mean the, the current value of the bundle that is consumed by JT is different from the current value of the bundle consumed by KT, which is something like that, right? So uh, they have uh, non-distorted budgets, the slope of which is minus r. You see that they have different preferences, they make different choices. Uh, and so the question is, where does this uh, difference between the, the, the two budgets uh, come from? And you see that it cannot come from what they get from their parents. So that means that they have been treated differently by the tax system, and this is what we don't want. With the consequence that, this is in red here, a redistribution or a decrease in inequality between those budgets is a strict social improvement, right? Should be a strict social improvement. Uh, that's the idea of responsibility. And you see, I mean, a little bit in a kind of dual way that, uh, I mean, the idea that children should not be penalized by the lack of altruism of their parents can be represented this way. Assume now that I have two agents who have the same preferences, uh, same utility function, but they do not have the same utility level at their consumption, which is represented by this. Uh, uh, what does that mean? I mean, 
uh, it means that, I mean, so, so compensation says that uh, because they have preferences, if they do not, and because they have the same preferences, if, if they do not end up having the same utility, uh, that must mean either from the fact that they have received different, uh, uh, I mean, inheritances, or because they've been treated differently by the tax system, which is unacceptable. And here the requirement is that we reduce the bundle inequality between those two uh, agents, individuals, uh, seen as, uh, I mean, uh, children, let's say, or uh, heirs. Okay, that's that's compensation. And the first point is that when we combine, uh, I mean, the, uh, those principles, we reach a social welfare function that needs to be a maximum that needs to be so maximizing the minimal level of let's say well-being or utility when utility is not the actual utility of the agent so the one defined by the utility function but when it is reconstructed so as to satisfy those two principles and here is the reconstruction so if you want to measure the utility of an agent consuming this uh, i mean uh, arbitrary um, uh, bundle and having preferences represented by those uh, uh, by, by, by this indifference curve, the first thing we need to do is to look at the non-distorted budget that leaves this agent indifferent to uh, what uh, uh, I mean they are consuming, and then to measure this budget by, for example, the maximal uh, consumption that uh, such a budget would lead. We call that the consumption equivalent utility. Uh, it is uh, obviously in the frame of the equivalent income uh, uh, way of measuring uh, uh, well-being. And it turns out that being maximum in this uh, way of measuring uh, utility or measuring well-being of the agents is a way, and basically the only way, of satisfying those, those principles. Why does it satisfy Pareto? Well, you see that uh, uh, the utility is measured by reference by reference to indifference curves and by equivalence to the current consumption and that is typical way of satisfying Pareto and you see that it is a way of satisfying responsibility because it advocates that equality means that people should uh, uh, at the end have the same undistorted uh, uh, or should be indifferent, indifferent to the same undistorted uh, uh, budget which is exactly what the responsibility was uh, trying to achieve. And why uh, does it satisfy compensation? Well, you see that the, this way of measuring uh, utility does not depend on G and therefore will indeed recommend to equalize, uh, uh, I mean, the indifference curve of agents having the same preferences, right? So we are, uh, I mean, it turns out that the, this is the, the only kind of social welfare functions that can satisfy the principle we are interested in. And so the objective is to see what will be the, the, the best tax system if we are egalitarian uh, in this um, uh, way of measuring uh, utility. Okay, so two quick uh, comments. So the fact that uh, uh, we obtain something that is uh, uh, maximum so that we go from inequality aversion to infinite inequality aversion is pretty common in the literature. What is less common is that uh, uh, responsibility and compensation in this uh, model are compatible. They can be combined in spite of the fact that we have a, a, a double heterogeneity among the agents, heterogeneity in preferences and heterogeneity in uh, inheritance. And this is uh, due to the fact that everybody faces the same price of bequest, which is uh, the intergenerational rate of uh, interest. Anyway, so this is to, uh, I mean, comment on the link, on the link, on the link to some uh, literature. And so let us come to the uh, main part, which is the, uh, the, pol the policy. So uh, we assume that, I mean, we would like to, to design a demogrant and a tax function by looking at the long run uh, consequence of that. So you see that uh, the subscript T has disappeared. We are interested in uh, not having a tax scheme that changes at every period, but we would like to evaluate the, uh, the quality uh, of uh, tax schemes as a function of the uh, long-term influence. And so we look at the long-term equilibrium allocation associated to uh, uh, I mean, uh, tax, tax function and uh, demogrant. 
okay? Uh, we, we assume that it exists. We assume that it does not depend on initial conditions and that it is unique. Uh, I mean, that's a price to pay to have something to say. It is the same uh, assumption as in uh, PKMT and, and SAES. Very importantly, there is a government uh, budget constraint that we write like this. So you see that this is the income of the agent, it is a consumption. So this is the formula of the bequest of the agent, and this is the, uh, the tax that can be positive or negative paid by this agent. So you see that the government constraint written like this means that the demogrant that is paid to a generation is funded by the taxes paid by this generation. Okay, so why, why, why so? Well, I mean, of course, in reality, people were born and, uh, and die in different uh, uh, periods of, of time. But we need to aggregate those people into generations. And you see that here we aggregate here in the way uh, that captures the idea that the, the, the demo grant that I get during my life, capital D, so the, the help that I get uh, from the government during my life, capital D, is paid by the taxes, uh, I mean, is funded by the taxes paid by the people that live at the same time as me. So the people with whom I have shared uh, the life. So you see that it is an arbitrary choice. The other choice would have been to divide D by R, meaning that uh, uh, what is collected at one period is put in the fridge and used in the next period to, uh, I mean, uh, fund the degrama grant of the next period. Uh, I mean, it could be good if uh, we were to study other, uh, I mean, uh, other, other questions, but in this model, it is not the right way of modeling the government constraint because as you can figure out, then it would be Pareto improving to uh, let the, the, the taxes be in the fridge, not for one generation, but for two generation that would allow us to fund D divided by R square, etc. Okay, so by internal consistency uh, of the model, we uh, have this uh, budget constraint. So uh, facing uh, TO and D, uh, agents make their choice. We look at the long run uh, of those consequences of those choice. And we say that uh, this uh, scheme is sustainable if the budget constraint is uh, satisfied by the corresponding long run equilibrium allocation. So here is the first result. We assume that at e, I mean, we assume that in the long run equilibrium allocation, there will be some agents, which we call A and L, that will inherit nothing, and that will have the most altruistic and the least altruistic uh, preferences. Okay, we do assume that do, those people exist in the economy, and this is the assumption that we need to prove that uh, uh, the demogrant needs to be positive. That that is redistributions need to come from the tax on bequest to the lifetime income uh, of the people. What is the intuition? Reasonably simple. Uh, remember that we are maximin in the utility of uh, the agents. The worst of are necessarily, according to our way of measuring well-being, are necessarily among those who inherit nothing, right? And so, uh, Think of laissez-faire, think of no, no tax. So tau is uh, equal to zero and D is equal to zero. Then I remember how the uh, consumption equivalent utility is measured. That means that the utility, the consumption equivalent utility of those who inherit nothing is precisely equal to W, right? All of them. Now let us assume that D is negative, right? We redistribute from the uh, uh, lifetime income to the, the bequest. Then this agent S, the agent that I have called S, the guy who did not inherit anything and who is self-centered, right, would have a, a utility that is W plus D. Remember that the, that the utility is measured at the maximum, uh, uh, at the maximum uh, uh, consumption associated to the non-distorted budget to which you are uh, indifferent, then this maximal utility would be negative, which means that this guy who is among the worst of at least a fair would be even worse if D is uh, negative, that therefore negative D is dominated by 
un laissez-faire. So you see, so five minutes. Uh, yes, five minutes. Thank you. So you see, I mean, the reasoning or the mechanism is that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, because of responsibility, we don't want to make the tax system favoring a kind of preferences over another kind of preferences, which means that those who prefer not to uh, leave anything to their children, you know, should be treated the same way uh, as the others. And the only thing to increase the well-being of the one, the self-centered who did not inherit anything is by increasing the demograph, that is, is by organizing redistribution, by taxing bequest to, uh, in order to increase the uh, lifetime income of the people. So uh, the second result is under some uh, additional assumption, but I mean, I mean, easy to buy. I don't want to enter into the details. And here we are pretty general in the, uh, in the tax schemes that we consider, except that we ask them to be such that, uh, you know, to subjected that minus two is single peaked. That means that show should be first decreasing and then increasing, okay? Maybe decreasing on an empty interval, in which case it will be everywhere increasing, or increasing in an empty interval, in which case it is everywhere decreasing. But uh, we, uh, I mean, by assumption and for the sake of tractability, uh, we uh, disregard the, the, ta the, the tax system that would be uh, first increasing and after that decreasing. So first we tax small uh, bequests and then we subsidize large bequests, uh, uh, et cetera. Okay, so uh, when is it the case that the two is uh, optimal? And so let me uh, go to the, uh, to, the, to the statement here. Uh, so the statement is that, uh, the, I mean, if it turns out that optimality requires that two is weakly increasing, okay, so no subsidy at all, then if there is no subsidy on a small uh, bequest, there should be an exemption from zero to a level. And what is this level? B-A-L-F, it is the equilibrium bequest of this agent A, so the guy, who, the most altruistic agent, under less, who did not inherit anything, under laissez-faire. Okay, so this threshold is determined by the behavior of the most altruistic uh, uh, agent should, I mean, uh, absent uh, any taxation. And we should uh, exempt uh, uh, this, th those bequests uh, from any tax. If it turns out that uh, the optimal tool is not weakly increasing, that means that if it turns out that it is optimal to first subsidize bequest and then tax, yet what is interesting is that the tax paid by this guy, the tax paid by the most altruistic uh, uh, individual who did not inherit anything is itself bounded above. So should be, uh, uh, I, mean, um, I mean, cannot be, cannot be too high. Okay, so that's the main, uh, that's the main, uh, uh, I mean, result here. And uh, let me, uh, I mean, let, let, let me summarize the, the, the paper and uh, uh, I mean, giving some uh, word, some intuition in word about this, uh, uh, this result. So what is the story? The story is that in this model uh, in which individuals are parents and children in turn, Responsibility and compensation are uh, compatible. We did use a social welfare function that is of the maximum type. And as a consequence, uh, the worst of those who should be given absolute priority, so those who should receive a positive social weight, are necessarily among those who did not inherit, inherit uh, anything from their parents. But those agents may themselves be either altruist, I mean, altruistic or uh, self centered. And the demograph is the only way to increase the well being of the self centered who did not inherit, uh, uh, inherit anything. And this is why a negative demograph cannot be optimal. On the other hand, the demograph and the bequest, so that's a combination of the two, and bequest subsidy, uh, that's a combination of those two that can be used and that should be used in case the uh, maximum requires to increase the well being of the altruistic individuals who did not uh, inherit uh, uh, anything. 
and the precise, uh, okay, the precise shape of the uh, optimal tax scheme depends on what is sustainable, which is unfortunately extremely hard to characterize in this model. Uh, with the final consequence and bequest, uh, so should be, uh, I mean, the, the tax, if they are taxed, the tax should be extremely low uh, until the bequest left by the uh, altruistic, the most altruistic individuals who did not inherit anything, and above that should be taxed as much as uh, sustainable. And I think that, oh, yes, and let me just conclude by. Uh, uh, coming back to, to the assumption and to Giacomo's question. So uh, if we do relax the assumption of a fixed W common to everybody, that means that, uh, uh, I mean, ideally we would like to uh, allow ability to earn income to be heterogeneous, allow preferences towards consumption and, le and leisure to be heterogeneous. So, so that ideally the, the I mean, labor income tax and the bequest tax systems should be designed simultaneously. But intuitively the main argument would still uh, hold. Why? Because even in this case, the worst off will be to be found among those who do not uh, receive any inheritance. And among those, uh, the only way of increasing the well-being of uh, uh, those who are self-centered would be by in having a strictly positive uh, D, and to, 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 to use the uh, symbol uh, of this model, which means that the contribution should go from the taxation of bequest system towards the, uh, uh, I mean, the tax system of the labor income. Uh, now, what on the other end, what, what would also uh, be important in this case is that the way we choose to redistribute income uh, based on uh, the uh, ability to earn income and based on preferences will determine what is key in the optimal tax scheme, which is this B, uh, you know, BALF, which is uh, the, the upper bound of the exemption interval. Uh, and uh, so if, if uh, if this is interpreted as the bequest left by those who have the lowest ability to earn income, huh, that means that this uh, upper bound on the exemption interval will not be very low, uh, will not be very high, huh, because if you work uh, all your life at the minimal uh, wage rate, I, I mean, uh, typically at the end of the day, you are not in a position to let a very high uh, amount of bequest. Uh, okay, and so fine, and this will depend on the fairness principles uh, applied to, to this taxation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much okay. for your attention. Thank you very much, Francois. So, questions? We started five minutes later, so I think we can, uh, we can be more generous now with time. Um, Joachim, or are you, you have already asked, or have you another question? We cannot hear. Uh, Mark? Mark? Yes, uh, so thank you, uh, Francois. Uh, that, that's very right, good. Right. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Francois, you addressed some of my concerns in your uh, final comments. Um, I still have an objection to the title of the paper. Uh, it says uh, fair. But it's fair in a model where the Ws are the same for everybody. Uh, and then in, the, in your Desideratum 3, you say, well, you should not penalize um, children that have uh, non-altruistic individuals. Uh, but uh, if you assume that, that the W uh, is different for people, uh, then uh, you should add another one that you should not penalize children for, for being uh, children of uh, poor parents. Uh, if you think about the inequality, about the fairness of, uh, the fairness of uh, inheritance tax, you are thinking more in terms of, you know, uh, the tax for the uh, very rich people rather than the tax uh, on the uh, non-altruistic, uh, uh, you know, rich or poor people. So it's just, I mean, uh, um, the, 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 the assumption of the common W, uh, even though you, you did address the, the issue in your 
final conclusions, I, see, I think that it's, uh, um, it's something that should be put more effort in the beginning, from the beginning, and you say uh, the, the title should be something like uh, fair inheritance succession when everybody does the same uh, income or something like that. Sorry, okay. I mean, I, okay. yeah. no, no, I, I, I understand, I understand. So uh, the point is that, uh, I mean, doing what we have done here is really at the limit of what is technically possible. So we would have loved to, <laughs> to be able to introduce the heterogeneity, which we completely agree. But, but really, okay, as you said, I, I, I do believe that I answer a little bit uh, this uh, comment in, uh, in this slide, but, uh, Okay, I hope I have been uh, convincing that, that the, the intuition, I mean, still holds, and I do believe that the intuition is only reinforced by your comment, right? So, I mean, the, 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 the focus should be on the, uh, I mean, the, the worst off will be those who do not inherit anything and who are children of poor parents. Absolutely, absolutely. There is no doubt about that. Yes. Okay, uh, Mark. Yes, thank you, uh, Francois. Uh, this is a uh, this is a very good um, uh, contribution, and indeed uh, very nice to show that when you have a specific social welfare function, you, you get more specific results. I have one suggestion. Um, you presented the, the assumption that uh, the motivation for altruism is a warm glow uh, phenomenon. I'm not sure you really need to present that uh, as an assumption because, in fact, so you have your framework with uh, H and C as uh, the space. But uh, people may like H for different reasons. You allow for heterogeneity of preferences. So some people might like H, uh, might like a G, sorry, is a contribution to their next, um, uh, no, it's H actually, yeah, they contribute. So, so that's um, something that uh, could be motivated by altruism in terms of the utility of the descendants and this sort of thing. So maybe you could have a more general presentation, but keep your results. Yes, thank you. So, but uh, okay, but what is absolutely key uh, is that so uh, is that parents are not indifferent between the following two situations. First, I the tax system I I, I mean transform my uh, uh, by bequest by I mean subsidy. Sorry, let me let me back up. So uh, I, here are two situations. First, the tax system because it subsidizes some bequests, give 100 euros more to my kids, right? And the other situation is that the, uh, the tax system, but not the tax system related to, be, to how we tax bequests, but how we tax income, huh? gives 100 euros more to my uh, kids. So what is key is that parents are not indifferent between those two, okay? Uh, and I do believe that it is relevant. I do believe that, you know, I mean, parents like to give something to their, to, to their kids. I, I do believe that, uh, so, uh, okay. So one thing is what we need to, to the result, but so clearly we need this uh, difference. It is absolutely key to, for the result. And I do believe that it's, it's capturing something that is uh, relevant. Okay, you, you'll have to explain me uh, better later because I don't understand that. It seems to me that the heterogeneity of preferences allows for, so given a, a, an heterogeneous um, uh, institution of taxation and all that, um, the only thing you need at the end of the day is that people have preferences over C and H and they can come from any motivation, but, but I, I must be wrong about something. You, you'll have to explain. To me. Thanks. Okay, so if there is time, then also I would uh, like to, uh... To, uh, to make a comment. So first of all, I, I like very much this approach because uh, if you take a more simplistic approach, uh, for instance, a two periods uh, model of, uh, of bequest, then uh, you have uh, the counterintuitive result that actually uh, the taxation of uh, interest income, the taxation of wealth and the taxation of bequest are basically equivalent. And um, uh, in this framework, uh, uh, you have a very strong uh, uh, argument for a specific role, a specific fairness role of inheritance taxation. So um, this does not uh, change uh, for the discussion of the equivalence between wealth and interest income taxation, but it is uh, a strong uh, argument in favor of a distinctive uh, 
inheritance taxation. So my questions would be, so the first one is that with respect to the, the assumption that you made at the beginning that, uh, um, that uh, you called it the, the compensation principle, I think. So uh, there could be a, a counter argument in the case in which uh, uh, you think that actually altruism is not uh, in, uh, an exogenous uh, inborn trait, but uh, uh, the, the willingness for a parent to leave a bequest to a child will depend also on the uh, kindness that has been experienced by the parent uh, from uh, the child. So that uh, there could be a counter argument saying, well, actually it is fair that if uh, an old parent has been uh, mis- uh, uh, treated uh, by the child, then uh, the parent should be free uh, to punish uh, the child. So uh, what is your response? And then uh, the second point is that uh, um, your assumption uh, one, I think, is, uh, um, is a bit unsatisfactory in the sense that it is not an assumption on the, the fundamentals of the model, uh, but it is an, an assumption on the equilibrium characteristic of the model. So an endogenous variable. So uh, isn't it possible to, uh, to have a more uh, explicit uh, uh, clarification of what you actually need in order to have the same uh, effect as uh, that uh, pos posited by that assumption? So based on the fundamentals? So, so, sorry, which assumption? Sorry, I'm, I don't think I, I, I got the, the point. The very first assumption you said uh, if in the long run equilibrium, um, both the most oh. altruistic and- Oh, sorry, yes, yes. So, and this is an assumption on endogenous uh, uh, oh. outcomes. So one uh, as a theoretician wonders, so what are, what are the assumptions that you need on the exogenous uh, uh, parameters of the model in order to produce the result? Yes, yes. Because we do not know uh, whether sure, sure. Uh, such a such a such an equilibrium, such as an hypothetical equilibrium, uh, could ever exist. No, no. I, I, okay, I completely agree. No, uh, and I, I agree that it is typically better to have uh, conditions on the, uh, I mean, exogenous of the model than, than on uh, something that take your group. Okay, so what you could have is, uh, you know, to to assume that uh, you have. Uh, a fraction of the population that is, uh, uh, I mean, of, of the different type. And that, you know, if you have, for example, complete independence between the types of parents and children, right, you would only, always have, uh, have this. So, I mean, simply that having directly an assumption on this equilibrium, uh, on this longer equilibrium, I, I mean, it's weaker. I completely agree with you that it is less elegant, but I mean, it, it is weaker and it really identifies uh, what we need. Now, I'm afraid I don't have much to say about your, uh, uh, about your first uh, question. So, uh, okay, so clearly it would, re it, it would require some, uh, uh, it would require some additional uh, parameter in, in, in the model to study that. My feeling is that you know, uh, I mean, my interpretation of, uh, of the responsibility uh, principle is that, you know, I mean, a taxing as a function of the, uh, of the preferences of the agent is, uh, I mean, something I, I prefer to avoid. And, and, uh, and your point seems to suggest that uh, uh, in this case, it, I mean, it would be it would be uh, legitimate to, to tax as a function of uh, uh, what they do. So, I mean, I don't know really, I, I, I don't have uh, thought enough of that, but at first glance, I would, you know, prefer some kind of incentivization of, uh, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, um, this, I mean, incentivizes people to behave, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, in an altruistic way. Uh, no, but I don't yeah. know, I know, uh, frankly, I, I, I don't know. I mean, the frame is that yeah. I would refrain to, to discriminate based on preferences, but I, I cannot say more than that, I'm afraid. Okay, so I think uh, we have to stop here. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Francois, and thank you the Thanks a lot. participants. We are going to resume in uh, six minutes, uh, uh, 
at uh, um, 12 o'clock uh, uh, Eastern time. Okay. Is Burak here? Yes, I'm here. Ah, Hi. great. Hi. So you also have a 30, 35 minutes. Okay, so, very good. Uh, this so is uh, the, last, the last paper of this session. Um, the title of which is uh, Robots, Capitalism and Socialism. The speaker is Burak Univeren of Illich Technical University, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me and thanks Colin and John for organizing this conference. Um, so the title of my uh, paper is Robots, Capitalism and Socialism. Let, let me start with my motivation. My motivation is a fundamental idea from the uh, Marxist theory of history. The, the base, in modern terms, the Marxist uh, theory of history is that uh, technological change is the root cause of socioeconomic change. So this quote, uh, I, I think, successfully summarizes the basic idea. A change in men's productive forces necessarily brings about a change in their uh, relations of production. Of course, the ultimate arbiter is the real world. So let's look at the data and uh, what the real world says. Okay, so the last 150 years with this dramatic changes in the uh, scope and role of markets, there, there has been a serious uh, change in, in institutional change in, in uh, markets role, uh, economic role. So we can see that uh, if you look at the text to GDP ratios, uh, starting from 1870s uh, and until very recently, the, the, the empirical trend is very robust and almost monotonic, and it's, it's non-decreasing, mostly increasing. And that, that suggests that the, the economic role of markets in uh, industrialized developed countries is dwindling, and it's, it's, it's becoming smaller and smaller over time. And this is an empirical regularity. And another empirical regularity that we see is a technological change. So uh, in 18th century, mechanization started. Uh, the, the, what you see here is, is, is a, a representation of what is known as uh, 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 the, the uh, Flying shuttle. That 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 that, that machine that machine was the basis of uh, uh, textile industry during the industrial uh, revolution, and during the 19th and uh, 20th century, uh, the pe that period is known as the period of industrialization and mechanization. These are all uh, labor-saving technologies, but today what we see is a slightly different form of technological change, we see robots now. Uh, so the uh, last 150 years with this perpetual uh, dwindling role for markets and uh, rising role for machines and robots. So let's summarize those, uh, yes institutional change, the declining economic role of markets and technological change, the rise of the machines and now robots. So in this study, what I would like to address is whether there is a causal relationship between these two. And the almost universal view is that um, certain social institutions are uh, more conducive to te te technical change while others prevent and stifle full innovation. So, in that view, technological change is seen as a byproduct, secondary implication of good institutions. So uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, and firms respond to the social institutions. That is how you get technological progress. Institutions give you innovation. So the, but which institutions? That's the way the debate is. So for example, according to Stiglitz and Piketty, in egalitarian institutions and ideologies, such as deregulation, trickle-down economics, and et cetera, stifle economic performance. Uh, and therefore, those institutions and ideologies uh, hinder innovation. So if you want innovation, you should have 
egalitarian institution and an egalitarian ideology. There are also other views, for example, both and Jinthus argue, argue that complete contracts kill innovation. The, innova the innovative nature of capitalism is due to, its com uh, due to incomplete contracts. What is the idea here? The idea is that if you have complete contracts, the future is frozen. There's nothing that you can do about it. There are no disequilibrium rents to be captured. So the, um, that, that would uh, kill the innovative nature of Marcus, which are, so these two views are exactly the opposite, the, the, the diametrically opposed the standard view. What is the standard view? In standard view, first of all, you should allow inequality. Why? Because entrepreneurs should know that if they are successful in innovating something, they should, they, they should be able to capture uh, the surplus. The second thing is that uh, uh, in contrast to Bowles and Jintis, contracts should be complete. Why? Because uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, firms should be sure that uh, uh, they will get back what they invest. So if with incomplete contracts, there would be ambiguities and that would discourage innovation and technological change. So what is the way of, uh, what is the standard way of uh, ensuring co co contracts are complete? Um, the standard way is uh, strong property rights, basically, um, um, patents, strong patents. Okay, so these are the, the major ideas in the field. And let's have a look at the historical development and let's see how do those ideas play out. Okay, so the Wright Brothers patent war. In 1903, Wright Brothers invented the first aircraft and they used the uh, patents they, and the, the patent protection was extremely strong in the US back then. They used the, the patent rights to prevent innovation so that they would be, they would still be the heroes in aviation industry. <laughs> At the end, uh, that caused Europe to get ahead of the US. Why? Because, because of lack of patent protection, uh, the aviation technology continued to develop in Europe. As a result, the, the US government stepped in because they realized that, that the, 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 the US started to lag behind Europe. So they, 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 they revoked, they practically revoked all patents in the field. They created a patent, what is known as a patent pool. All uh, aircraft manufacturers uh, had to be a member. It was, me membership was mandatory. And patents in the pool could be freely shared by all participants that happened in 1970. So what are the key lessons from Wright Brothers patent war? One, it definitely contradicts the strong international protection rights implies innovation idea. Why? Because US had strong uh, intellectual property rights, but that caused not innovation, but uh, that was detrimental to innovation. So it also contradicts the idea that weak intellectual property rights implies no innovation because Europe had the weak intellectual property rights, but that was the place where uh, we observed developments in aviation technology. But uh, the most important part, I believe, is that this example suggests a new form of causality. Innovation is the root cause of new institutions. What was happening here? The European innovation in aviation, uh, compelled the US government to come up with a new institution. So in this study, my claim is that this observation can be generalized. Um, so innovation is the prime mover in social history. Institutional change is secondary. It's a byproduct of innovation. And uh, even if that you can find some examples of where, where some good social institutions create innovation, these are blown out of proportion, extremely exaggerated. The rule is the opposite. So I'm, I, I will make a, a, a cart before the horse argument. Okay, so let me discuss several examples, historical examples where innovation changed social institutions. The first example is gender roles. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, only 5% of married women had jobs in the US. That ratio became 61% at the end of the century. Female college enrollment is more than males in the US since 1981. <laughs> and in the 19th century, the American family had six children on average. Today, the same figure is less than two. 
So what this means is that the 20th, 20th century witnessed an immense change in gender roles. So what is the reason behind this? So, okay, let's look at this guy. This is uh, Cheng, yeah, how you Cheng of the Cambridge University. He famously argues that the root cause is the machine that he's pointing out, the washing machine. The washing machine, he argues, revolutionized the society in more profound ways than the internet because it uh, moved, liberated the women, moved them from the confinement of their houses to, to the labor market. Okay, uh, so now you can say, what about the egalitarian ideology here? Feminism doesn't have any role in that. So this is specifically asked to Chang uh, in an interview with The Guardian. The Guardian asked this, are you serious? And he says, I am serious. Here's what he has to say. Feminism couldn't have been implemented unless there was this technological basis for a society where women went out and worked. Of course, it's not just the washing machine. At, at this point, he's, he's doubling down. He's totally do doubling down. It's pipe water, electricity, irons, and so on. So um, you might say, OK, this is one guy. He has strong beliefs in this issue. But probably that's not what the, the uh, scholars think is the case in, in general. That is wrong. The, he's just uh, expressing the astonishing consensus in the literature. So Golden and Cats, this is the, golden, this is the famous Golden and Cats, uh, Journal of Political Economy, Power of the Pill. They argue that the gender role changes in the 20th century was a consequence of contraceptive pills. So uh, when women were able to control their fertility, uh, they could plan their uh, professional lives and that is the reason why gender roles change. Greenwood, Jeremy Greenwood, uh, of Pennsylvania University, he uh, he adds um, the appliance boom during the nineteenth sorry twentieth century, angels of liberation, uh, Alicina Alicina of Harvard on the origins of gender roles. This is extremely interesting. This is very shocking. When I read when I first read this, I I, I was very surprised. The idea is the following: if, if they they say uh, that this is a purely empirical study, they argue that. Uh, if your ancestors used plow technology in farming, you are most likely to be a misogynist. So you, your ancestors' technology was changing how you think, your ideology, the way you view the world. So, and there are other studies, but the point is that uh, Chang's idea is, is not a, a, a strong idea from a radical, it's, it's just a consensus. Um, so, are there other examples? In the original paper, I present different examples. Of course, due to the time limit, I cannot discuss all of those examples, but I would like to point out a, a couple of interesting examples. For example, uh, in 1903, the, uh, the Food and Drug Administration was founded in the US. Why was that? Uh, here it is, oh, sorry. Why did that happen? Because there was widespread food fraud in one instant, Due to uh, fake milk, what is known as swill milk scandal, 8,000 children died because they were poisoned because of fake milk. But why? Why was that happening at the time? Because 19th century is the century of chemical revolution. Elaborate techniques in food food became available for uh, agricultural producers because of this chemical revolution. So we see, we see this again, technological change, social problem than an institutional change. There are also other examples. The other example, for example, uh, that can be interesting is uh, deunionization in US, UK, and Canada. According to Ajemolu and Agyan, Philip Agyan of Harvard University, the reason behind the unionization is not neoliberal ideology or uh, some institutional um, uh, settings or how the working class lost power, it has nothing to do with it. They say that skill bias technical change. So, and, it, and their argument is, I will theorize this technological change, social problem, institutional change structure. And they use exactly the theory. It's, it's I, I think it's beautiful. They, they, they exactly use the theory that I will about to uh, develop in this presentation. The argument is that um, the, as the skill bias technical change widened the wage gap, skilled uh, young workers refrained from unionized jobs voluntarily. And that is the reason why the unions collapsed. 
Uh, so there are other examples as well. Um, you, you can look at those. The people I, I discussed them with length. However, of course, you can, there, there can be possible criticisms of this idea. For example, what about country examples? Aren't there cases where uh, social institutions create technological change? You can say, maybe I'm just cherry picking examples here. And you can also say, I'm just distorting historical facts or the literature is on. So I, again, due to the time limit, I cannot address all of these uh, possible criticisms. But what I can do is to show you that the reasoning behind first technological change, then subsequently social change, and the, why this is reasonable from a theoretical perspective, and why the opposite causality is very unlikely. OK, so here's the theory. First, I argue that designing a social institution today now today, that would be compatible with the technologies of the future is impossible. That why? Because of two types of ignorance. But the, the, I, I call double the, the double sided ignorance. So first of all, no one can fully foresee the potential problems that would be created by new technologies. We will discuss examples of that. This is the first type of ignorance. Second type of ignorance is that no one knows new is how new institutions would interact with the existing society. You can have speculations, you can have ideas, but you cannot prove it. That's impossible. So due to this double ignorance, institutional change and adaptation necessarily requires the uh, actual technological change to be observed. First, you should see what's happening. You should see the outcome. Then you, you can take action. Otherwise, you're just risking everything for a potential risk for which you have no idea. So uh, that means the temporal order is necessarily first innovation, that, that, then social change. So the Marxist view, I believe, is a voluntary choice by the general public, policymakers, and the people in power. We don't want to uh, risk everything before seeing the actual evidence. The ultimate arbiter is the real world. So uh, I call this temporal priority of innovation. And it's a, it's a way to rationalize what is known as the Marxist history of theory, the, the Marxist theory of history. Okay, so let's, let's, let me show you my examples here. So I, in this example, I will discuss the, the 21st century automation. And I will show that no one has any idea about the issue. And I'm serious about this. So it's commonly argued that robots and AI technologies will continue to replace humans. So that can cause many problems. And there are possible policy proposals. Let's see some of them. One, universal basic income. Two, taxing robots. Three, reforming the education system so that uh, our children will, will be uh, ready for the technologies of the future and this platitude, blah, blah, blah. OK. So, the, the reality is, the fact of the matter is that no one truly knows how these institutions would impact our lives. Let's see, let's start with UBI. For example, Paul Krugman says UBI, UBI is too expensive because it is unconditional and universal, which means uh, for 320 million people, you should pay $12,000 $12, per annum, which is huge. That, that's the consequence of being unconditional and universal. And actually, if you look at the data, Krugman argues, there's no automation problem. There are several ways to look at it. And he, the way he looks at it, he says, we don't see the dramatic uh, negative impact of automation in the data. Andrew Yang, for example, argues exactly the opposite, looking at the same data and looking, looking at the same reasoning. So for example, he says, the other social UBI, UBI would save money. Why? Because it is unconditional and universal, the same uh, assumption, but the conclusion is com completely different. Why? Because that UBI could replace other social programs. Moreover, because it is unconditional and universal, there would be less bureaucracy. You don't need to decide who is eligible, who is not eligible. That would save money. And why do we need that? Because when you look at the data, you see that robotization is a huge issue. But that's my point, double ignorance. No one knows what's happening actually. And everyone has strong views. As a third person looking at this, I say uh, it's, 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 it's not certain. So in order to step in and do something, we should see the actual developments. Another example is the uh, robot taxes. Bill Gates says we should tax the robots because humans are taxed, but robots are not. So th this asymmetry in taxation is unfair and inefficient. 
European Union uh, published a report on that, and they they they, they are very uh, critical of this argument because they say there's no way we will punish innovation and ro tax ro robots because international competition. They don't they don't want to lag behind the others. Uh, probably they mean U.S. and China, but they're not explicit about it. They're just an international competition. So at the end, what we see here is that, of course, AI technologies will continue to be developed, maybe limited in scope, as Krugman argues, or maybe they will be revolutionary, as uh, Andrew Yang says. But uh, whether it is large or small, this means that techno these technologies will have an impact on our, on our social institutions. This is my point. So we first, we cannot make a, decision, a serious political decision before seeing what those technologies will entail. And when they do have an impact, they will change the, the institutions. So the, I claim that this impact will be similar to the Wagner's law. What is Wagner's law? Wagner's law is the uh, monotonic increasing uh, empirical regularity of tax to GDP ratios. Wagner is the first person who noticed that. He said, okay, uh, what we see in the data is that uh, more prosperous societies tax more. Not the, only the rate, but even the tax to GDP ratio is higher. Um, so I, I think uh, AI technologies will have a similar effect. And this idea is based on a very simple concept in public, or, or a couple of simple concepts in public economic theory. One, modern automation technologies produce public goods. They are not public goods. Of course, they are public goods, but uh, all technologies are public goods because it's information. Information is a public good. I'm not, I, I don't mean that. What I mean is that the output is a public good. And they almost perfectly substitute for private goods. To be more specific, automation technologies private serv provide services without rivalry in their use. Let me show you an example. Driverless car technology. This is, a, this is quintessential, like the, the classic example of AI and automation. Okay. There are more than 3 million people who are actual human drivers in the US. So that's 3 million people. What about the driverless car technology? A single autonomous car technology can drive countless vehicles simultaneously. What does that mean? That means there's no rivalry in, in, in its use. However, humans provide a private service. When a person drives a car, that means that person cannot drive another car. So there's rivalry. And this technology, driverless car technology, is a perfect substitute of the uh, human service. There are also other examples. Again, due to time limit, I will not get into it, but probably you, you, you will immediately understand what I mean here. Netflix is, is, is a single digital platform. Uh, and it can serve the whole world, no rivalry consumption. And what it did was essentially substituting Blockbuster. And so Blockbuster was based on a, a private good service that the store clerks. So again, the same mechanism. So based on this, I make the following observation. The first observation is this. Private provision of public goods that are perfectly, that perfectly replace other private goods is an interesting feature of the 21st century automation. You can say, maybe this is always, no, this, this was not the case during the industrial revolution. Do you remember the flying shuttle? It was not, uh, it, it, it didn't uh, produce a public good and it didn't replace private goods. Uh, so based on this observation, so coming today, uh, I argue that this is a perfect recipe for market failures. That is huge corporations producing public goods to replace private goods. Why is that a, a perfect recipe for market failures? Because all reason that means monopolization, high markups, inefficiency, loss of jobs, stagnating wages, soaring profits, inequality, and etc. cetera. Uh, so what can we do? There are several different uh, options that we have, free markets and social democracy. I will not get into this issue of free markets. I don't, I don't think anyone here is interested in that. Um, but the, they don't, if, even if you have no political position, they don't offer too much. 
Social democracy, let's move to social democracy, what is interesting. Social democracy, as I understand it, is a socioeconomic system where prices are determined by the markets, while the government redistributes income to enhance inequality. Okay. But these features of social democracies are often seen within the limits of free market capitalism as well. Why is that? Because individuals and firms can freely invest their money in social democracy, so social democracy is seen as a form of capitalism. Uh, Steven Pinker of Harvard University uh, summarizes this view. Free market capitalism is compatible with any amount of social spending. I totally disagree. This is not true. Let me explain. Because <laughs> taxation means the government controls actually how we invest our money. The easiest way to see this is the second fundamental term of welfare. What does it say? It says any allocation can be produced uh, or uh, supported by an appropriate lump sum redistribution of income. We, if that means basically the government can control the incentives of each and every decision maker, including what they wish to do with their wealth. The only issue is that the government should redistribute income uh, in a sufficiently strong way. So. You can say, but that's not the only dimension of private property. You should also enjoy the good, right? Taxation is a direct infringement of that as well. So if you tax money, that means the government says, okay, you nominally you can have those land factory or whatever, but I don't care. The uh, benefits of, the, of that uh, property will go to someone else. So at, at the end, it's not true that social democracy is a form of free market system. I argue that government can seize the control of private property by simply redistributing income. This is a very well known result in theoretical economics. It's actually, there's no counter example to that. With a sufficiently rich dimension of redistribution, all models show the same thing. Government can make you want whatever it wants you to want. So according to the classic definition, this is socialism public ownership of means of production. The government wants you to want something and it can achieve this. In reality, however, taxation is a very distortionary and ugly tool. So we don't, we don't really want that. So uh, it would create inefficiencies. Is there anything beyond social democracy? Giacomo's argument, uh, uh, project, Progressive uh, Sovereign Welfare Fund is a fantastic idea, I believe. Stakeholder corporations that, that that would also work, and according to my perspective, these are all still socialism because if stakeholders cooperation means that you do what the public wants to do, what wants to be done. So it's it's it's, it's a nominally it can the, the corporation can belong to a, a group of rich people, but at the end it behaves according to the uh, benefits of the public. Kantian cooperation. That, that will be discussed uh, soon by John, uh, that, that is also a form of uh, social, or what, what we can offer beyond social democracy and we need to discuss these issues. And let me conclude. I argue that innovation is the prime mover for social change. It's not the other way around. It, uh, it, the, the, the reverse causality is putting the cart before the horse. And so we, that's the reason why we know AI uh, will shape uh, our lives and redefine capitalism in the future. And that is because AI-based systems actually produce public goods. They are not producing uh, tangible goods that are um, uh, common in, in industrial revolution. This would create inefficiencies and inequalities. And history shows that social democracies offer solutions to mitigate these problems. And a sufficiently strong social democracy, I believe, is actually a socialist economy. And I would like to conclude with Joachim's uh, quote from uh, Joachim. Of course, the ultimate arbiter is the real world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Burak for also keeping uh, time and uh, this uh, very uh, challenging uh, talk, challenging uh, uh, 
arguments that I think also give us a little bit more optimism because I mean, this is a, a, a conference on socialism. And uh, so it seems that, uh, so we do have a, uh, a lot of problems to solve, but at least it, according to you, uh, the technological uh, developments in the near future are uh, helping uh, us to go in that direction. So uh, we are uh, set for questions. So who, who would like to start? Mark, please. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Borak. That was uh, very stimulating. I had not thought of this. Uh, a feature of the new innovations that uh, have a lot of public good uh, uh, aspect. Um, my, my question is about the, uh, the idea that was, for instance, um, argued for, advocated in uh, Atkinson's uh, latest book on inequality, that we should have a democratic control of the direction of innovation. Um, mm -hmm. what, what's your view about this idea that we should have uh, more control uh, so it, it goes somehow in the other direction to what you are describing? So for, uh, from a normative perspective, I totally agree. That is because innovation uh, almost completely consists of externality. Uh, when a new device is developed, that means all our lives change. And when firms develop those ideas, new technologies, they don't take into account how our lives would be improved. So there's, there's a positive externality that means Presumably, the private sector, we, we, we praise the private sector excessively for, the, for their innovative nature. I think that, that, is, that is not exactly true. Probably they are not uh, sufficiently investing in innovation. So uh, one way uh, to do that is to, of course, uh, co control the innovative industries. So I, I, I think that that's a very from a norm normative perspective, this is uh, something that I would support. But the positive part, I mean, would it be real? That's, that, this, this is, I think this is the challenging part. The ch and that would happen, my argument is that, social change can only happen with crisis. We, you need a crisis. So that's what I have to say. Joachim? We cannot hear you. Uh, Joachim, are you muted? So, sorry. Joachim. Since you refer to the economic theory of public goods, uh, and, and I totally agree with, with your take that, that uh, these, um, uh, these uh, new developments, what they do is to transform what were private goods into public goods. They also do another thing, which is to, uh, pro so public goods are the ones as you, uh, started saying that the ones that are non-rival in, in non rival in consumption. There is a second characteristic that may or may not be present in public goods. Excluded. The possibility of exclusion. Now, one of these, uh, all these technological uh, improvements, what they also, what they make, is that to make uh, easier the possibility of exclusion for already existing public goods that before, but now it's uh, the, 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 all this information, since it goes to the internet, can be subject to passwords and all yes. sorts of regulations. Before, you know, uh, so this goes more to the one of the uh, slides that said, well, what this uh, will do is to in, uh, increase uh, uh, monopolization. Hard by, uh, that's what we are seeing. You know, that's yes. what we are seeing. And, uh, yes. uh, you know, uh, anyway, just a comment. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I, I think this is also related to the uh, economic theory. I think economic theory also emphasizes too much the private good part. But in reality, most of the goods that are, we are using are actually public goods. And you don't have to convince me. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, so uh, since I'm here with a friend, the audience, so I, I would like to make this point very, very clear that, that uh, and I, I'm also guilty. Like we, we are, when we analyze economic models, we put too much emphasis on private goods. That, that's a serious issue. Oh, so exclusivity. John, yeah. John sorry. 
I think this is an extremely uh, uh, original and welcome uh, rejuvenation of the theory of historical materialism that I've always thought is the best part of Marxism, uh, despite Jerry Cohen's difficulty in, in uh, proving that it made sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so this notion of the, of, the, of the private goods becoming public, I think is a very, uh, is correct and very powerful notion. Uh, there's another very simple corollary to this that you didn't mention, which that uh, these innovations that we're seeing now with the internet also make it the case that all uh, pr private information about individuals becomes a public good. So easy mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. harvest all kinds of information about individuals from uh, uh, through the internet, uh, through looking at the patterns of what they purchase and how they run their lives. I mean, cell phones now make it possible to know where everybody is at any instant. Uh, and the social, so that's the social problem that there are going to be a lot of opportunistic people, in particular capitalists, who want to exploit that information about people to manipulate them. And that's mm -hmm. going to require uh, socialism in the sense of a state that protects it protects the, uh, the individual's uh, private information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I think I one, 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 one extra point, the one sure. example of this, I think it was Andreu Mascolel, who I first heard make, make this comment that, that uh, private health insurance becomes, uh, uh, becomes uh, ter terribly dangerous when information about people's health status becomes uh, available to all insurance companies. So you're gonna have to have a national health insurance system to protect people from, from uh, manipulation and from not getting insurance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I don't, I totally agree. The, the, the issue here, I, I think it's a little bit technical, but it's, it's related to machine learning algorithms. The, basically modern automation technologies are based on uh, enormous amount of data. If you have data, you can develop any form of automation technology that uh, that would accomplish any form of task. So you just need data. So that's the reason why I, I, I think your point is very accurate so because the, the data is everything now. So uh, it, 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 if it is privatized, that means monopolization uh, uh, of uh, data and so it, 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 it would have very terrible effects. And I, I, and I agree that, with that. Uh, I think there's a comment here. In the uh, chat. Yes, can, I, I cannot properly read. Can, can, I, can, I cannot read it, so can you? So, uh, okay. Can anyone? <laughs> so one, uh, one was the question, um, um, why driverless car technology are public goods? Oh, the, right, maybe, uh, yes. So individuals have to pay for them to consume them. Yes. So won't markets price them optimized? So this is again this is the excludability issue. Yes, they so because of the time limit, I didn't want to get into the details. But as Joachim also mentioned, uh, excludability is not an intrinsic feature of any commodity. You can change it. Look at YouTube. YouTube was completely free and it was a public good. Now it is partially excludable because you can, um, you can pay money, subscribe and get better <coughs> services. So it, you can change it as you want. That's the reason why it's, it's not very crucial. But with, even with excludability, uh, optimal pricing doesn't follow. What you have, of course you can, you can, <laughs> you can uh, optimally price theoretically. What, should, what you should do is, is to achieve first degree price discrimination. Otherwise it is inefficient. So you should, what you should do is to charge everyone exactly what the consumer surpluses for the services that you're providing. And that will just prove my point, even make it stronger. So with excludability, the only result you would see would be uh, more profits, more inequality, and the services that we get would be so expensive that we would be indifferent between uh, using them and not using them. <laughs> so the all consumer surplus would be transferred to the technological developers. That would just make my point stronger. 
Uh, Colin, you want yes, to I have a I have a request from uh, one of the attendees to read their question. So it reads: uh, th Thank you, Barack, for your uh, techno optimistic conclusion. But given the unanticipated but near environmental catastrophic catastrophic effects of some technologies, and also in view of natural resource limits. Shouldn't choices today be informed by caution and more environmentally friendly and humanistic choices? For example, in Japan, some see robots as a solution to declining population needed to take care of elderly. This could be solved by immigrants from lower income Asian countries. So can I, can I start with the environmental impacting? Okay, so the, this, this is exactly how I think that the socioeconomic order would change. I don't say that, if, if, I, if I gave this impression, I'm sorry, I don't say that things will be nice. I, I say the exact opposite, things will get ugly. That is the reason why we will fight for change. Because of these technological changes, things will get ugly. So we will try to make them better. That this is how it will work out. I, that this is my claim. So if, uh, if disasters happen, that would be uh, the motivation for social change. And I'm not very optimistic about it. So the problem is this, you cannot convince, so this is, this is the ex exactly this is the issue. You cannot convince other people that, that is uh, environmental problems are definite, that they will definitely come. So what will happen? We will wait and maybe those because, because we wait, because we cannot convince everyone, and we, so we wait, uh, maybe they will come, those uh, disasters will happen. And that's the reason why I say technology is the root cause of uh, social change. Um, oh, the, and the Im immigrants part, yes. Maybe the uh, using immigrants instead of uh, robots, would be better for the humankind, social welfare, efficient, I don't know. But that's not how things work. Uh, so the, my point, I'm, this is the, uh, I think the most uh, uh, different presentation in the sense that I have no normative claim in this presentation. I don't, I don't make any argument about what is good, what is bad, my argument is a bit more positive, so maybe it's better. But that that uh, the uh, social welfare is 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 not the is is not the uh, root cause of change. Okay, so um, Burak, there are some questions in the chat, and yes. um, uh, so since uh, we are running now out of time, I would like to um, invite you to uh, have a look at those. Uh, questions and uh, uh, I would be grateful if you could uh, answer them then uh, in the chat or uh, uh, talking directly to the to the yeah. participants as you like okay. okay very good very good so thank you very much and uh, we are going to have a break of half an hour so we are going to resume at quarter past one eastern time so thanks again and see you later John So uh, it is my pleasure to chair the last session and introduce John Roma, who actually needs no introduction. So I will not introduce him. I will rather thank him for organizing this brilliant conference. And I would like everyone to just note that the very organization of this conference is a testimony, not only to John's intellectual skills, which we all know, but his political beliefs and activism organizing a conference such as this one against all odds uh, when the political climate in the USA was very, very different and in the middle of a pandemic is itself a political statement about how important and vital socialism is. And without further ado, let's hear what John has to say about what is socialism today, conceptions of a cooperative economy. Thank you, Roberto. Oh, I'm having trouble getting my slides to move there. Let's see. 
Okay, every economic system, I believe, uh, stands on three pillars. It has a behavioral ethos, a distributive ethic, and a set of institutions, including property relations, contract law, markets, and so on. The behavioral ethos of capitalism is competition of each against all, constrained by nature. It's a theory of every person goes it alone. The distributive ethic is from each according to her rightful endowments to each according to what she can get. And then of course the property relations and institutions are well known by all of us. Uh, I had invited uh, Katrina Pistor, who wrote this wonderful book, The Code of Capital, to be at this conference. Uh, but unfortunately, she was unable to attend because she's the one who's written about how law is used to create capital. Socialism, the behavioral ethos is cooperation. It's people working together, facing the constraints imposed by nature. The classical uh, distributive ethic is from each according to his ability to each according to his work, or in the later formulation of G.A. Cohen, socialist equality of opportunity, which has been discussed in particular, was uh, defined for you yesterday by Suresh. The property relations are a great variety that people have talked about, but uh, at least uh, nowadays, most people advocate that there be markets under socialism. And there's a lot of discussion about what the property relation should be. Some of these ideas were put forth yesterday by uh, Isabel and Helen. The link among these three pillars is supposed to be the following. If people act according to the behavioral ethos in an economy where the property relations are as specified, then the distributive ethic will be realized. Models of socialism have been proposed now for almost 100 years, going back to Oscar Lange and Fred Taylor in the 1930s. These models give only lip service, however, to the ethos of cooperation. It's what philosophers call a gloss on the theory. Here, I embed a precise model of cooperation into models of socialism to produce, I think, a more adequate blueprint. Why do we need the ethos? Aren't the property relations of socialism, such as state ownership of firms or worker-owned firms sufficient, along with rules of distribution to characterize cooperation? I don't think so. I thought so for a long time before I developed the theory of cooperation. Cooperation, I claim, refers to behavior how people make decisions to solve the problems they face. Socialist property relations are insufficient to characterize behavior. So it's been a lacuna uh, developing this third pillar in the theory of socialism, in my view. The behavioral ethos of capitalism, each competes against all others, constrained by nature, is beautifully modeled by Nash equilibrium in games. In a Nash equilibrium, each worker or investor treats the behavior of all others as parametric in her own decision problem. But with, so that's the idea of going it alone. But with this optimization protocol come two major social pathologies, the free rider problem and the tragedy of the commons. You actually can view that as one pathology by, you can always restate a free rider problem as a tragedy of the commons by changing the definition of the strategies. So it's really one problem. Kantian optimization is an alternative. I propose to model cooperative behavior by Kantian optimization and its attendant equilibrium concept or concepts. Uh, a game, Think of a game as a set of payoff functions of the players, each defined on a vector of contributions that the payers make. They could be, they could be labor times or monetary contributions. Uh, of, uh, it could be quite general. 
the contribution is going to be just a number, a non-negative number. So a game is, is called, specified by these payoff functions defined on the vectors of contributions, is called monotone increasing. If each player's payoff is an increasing function of the contributions of the other players. So think of public good games. The more that you contribute to the public good, the better off am I. That's a monotone increasing game. A game is monotone decreasing if each player's payoff is a decreasing function of the contributions of other players. So think of congestion externalities in a fishery. Each fisher contributes labor, and the more labor other fishers offer, the worse off is my utility because that increases the congestion on the lake and changes that makes the lake less productive of fish. So here are the main theorems that, the, that are used in developing the theory I'm going to talk about. The Nash equilibria of any monotone game, increasing or decreasing, are generically Pareto inefficient. In the vernacular, for monotone increasing games, this is called the free rider problem. That is to say, people offer too little of the contribution that they're supposed to make from the social viewpoint in, Mo in Nash equilibrium in monotone increasing games. That's the free rider. For monotone decreasing games, this is called the tragedy of the commons. So in monotone decreasing games in Nash equilibrium, players offer too much of the contribution. However, the Kantian equilibria of any monotone game, increasing or decreasing, are Pareto efficient. That's the nice fact. I'm not going to prove it here, but uh, it's easy to find proofs for it and other things I've written. Public goods and positive externalities can almost always be modeled as monotone increasing games. And public goods, public bads, and negative externalities like climate change, where the contribution is emissions, can almost always be modeled as monotone decreasing games. Hence, we see the possibility of resolving the free rider problems and the tragedy of the commons that are integral to these games under Nash reasoning by appealing to Kantian optimization as the decision protocol. So here's just a, a formal statement. A game is specified as a set of uh, payoff functions, VI, which map a vector of contributions into a number. Uh, the definition of a monotone increasing game is that every function VI is an increasing function of LJ for all J not equal to I. And a monotone decreasing game Set is one in which every VI is a monotone decreasing function of LJ, J not equal to I. The definition of Nash equilibrium is that for all numbers L, non-negative numbers L, uh, if the L is the best response, L star, L star I is the best response to what the other players are doing, which is this vector here. That's the definition of Nash equilibrium. You're going to see that the definition of Kantian equilibrium is only a little bit different from that. First of all, I want to define a simple Kantian equilibrium. A number L star is a simple Kantian equilibrium if for all i, L star maximizes VI of LLLLL. In other words, all players agree that if everyone were to take the same action, they would each like that action to be this particular L star. So to say it again, in, in Kant's words, each takes the action he or she would will that everyone take. Uh, this is a slight uh, variation on Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative. Simple Kantian equilibria exist essentially only when all players are identical, except for their names. That is to say, in games that are symmetric. I'm now going to define a multiplicative Kantian equilibrium 
So the, the problem with simple Kantian equilibrium is that it basically only exists when games are symmetric. So it's a very special case. A profile of contributions L1 through Ln is a multiplicative Kantian equilibrium. If now you've got to look at the magenta things, the magenta adjectives or adverbs, no player would like that all players rescale the entire vector of contributions by any factor. So that means for all agents and for all non negative numbers rho, to rescale the whole vector by rho for person i is never better than simply accepting the vector that is, that is on the table. So nobody wants to rescale the whole vector. So let's tell a story which uh, indicates uh, how this might come about. Suppose we're fishers on a lake, the lake is, has de decreasing returns to fish as a function of labor. It's a concave production function. And we're at a certain allocation of labors on the lake. And I think to myself, being one of the fishers, gee, I'd like to expand my labor time by 5%. But in Nash, Nash thinking, I don't think at all about the consequences for other people. I don't, I simply take other people's behavior as being parametric at the given allocation that we're sitting at, L1 through Ln. What the Kantian says is, well, I'd like to increase my labor time by 5%, but that's only fair if I allow everyone else to increase his labor time by 5%, because there are negative externalities here. So fairness requires that if I'm permitted to do that, so should everybody else be. So I'll only make that increase if it's true that I would be happier if ever I would be at least as well off if everybody increased his labor by 5%. So what's the equilibrium concept associated with that kind of thinking? It's precisely this. It's a vector of contributions such that nobody wants to rescale the whole vector up or down. The final concept I'm going to define is additive Kantian equilibrium. A vector of contributions L1 through Ln is an additive Kantian equilibrium. If no player would like all players to translate the entire contribution vector by any constant. In other words, nobody would like to add a number lambda to everybody's contribution or subtract a number lambda. Lambda can be positive or negative in this case. So this is the definition. There's a hunting story that goes along with this, it turns out, but I think I'll skip that. So now let me give a very simple canonical model of capitalism with one, with one uh, commodity. There's a firm that produces this commodity as a function of capital and labor. Citizens are endowed with amounts of capital and labor and a share of the firm that operates this technology and with preferences over consumption and labor. There's an exogenous tax rate on income and prices for the good labor and capital. Firm, the firm demands capital and labor to maximize profits. After tax income comes from investment, wage, labor, and profit shares and a demogrant that's provided by the tax. Citizens supply capital and labor to maximize utility given the contributions of all the others. Capital, labor, and consumption markets all clear. So that's a standard definition of very simple Arrow de Bura equilibrium with exogenous profit shares. Now consider this game. Uh, as, as a function and view it as a function of the labor contributions of everyone, this is going to be the uh, income of the individual at the supplies of labor and capital and given the profits of the firm. This will be his after-tax income. And then he or she will receive a demogrant, which is equal to one nth of the total 
uh, GNP of the society. LS is just the sum of all the LIs uh, or the total labor supply. And this is the capital supply. So dividing this by P simply gives us his consumption, the person's consumption, comma, labor. So we can view this as defining a game uh, where, the, um, where the arguments are the labor supplies of all the agents. The statement of our degree equilibrium is that L1 through LN is a Nash equilibrium of this game. That is to say, given the labor supplies of all the others, my labor supply in equilibrium must be the solution to this problem, where the only variable now appears here and here. But this is not, and appears inside here. If there are many, if n is very large, we can actually effectively ignore the contribution that uh, the individual makes in here. Now, this is a monotone increasing game. Why? Because as other people's labor supplies increase, Caterus paribus, my consumption increases because the demograt increases. So there's a positive externality from the labors of others in the demograt for each person. It's a monotone increasing game. And hence, we have the possibility of resolving the inefficiency associated with Nash equilibrium if T is positive. Should have said that. If T is zero, this equilibrium is Pareto efficient, but if T is positive, it's not Pareto efficient. There's a dead weight loss to this taxation. And we might think that we have the possibility of uh, resolving that positive, uh, that inefficiency if workers were using Kantian optimization. So the arrow de Bre the first theorem of welfare economics under capitalism is that the equilibrium of a capitalist economy is Pareto efficient when the tax rate is zero and inefficient otherwise. So the deadweight loss of taxation is the explanation that's due to the free rider problem of the labor supply game. I'm now gonna define social democracy. This is the first of two models that I'll, uh, that I'll discuss today. The definition is the same as in uh, the definition is the same as in capitalist equilibrium, except we substitute that the labor supply vector is an additive Kantian equilibrium of the labor supply game. I've just replaced Nash with additive Kantian. That's the unique difference between my model of social democracy, which has private ownership of firms, but in which workers cooperate in the sense of optimizing in that way. Under standard convexity assumptions, the social democratic equilibrium exists for any tax rate in zero one. And the first welfare theorem becomes that a social democratic equilibrium for any tax rate is Pareto efficient. In other words, the equity efficiency trade-off disappears. I'm now gonna discuss a second model. In this model, the firm has no shareholders. There's no market for equity. Of course, the market for shareholders was not modeled in the Arrow de Brim model that I gave either. The entire, but they don't exist at all in this case, there's no theta. The entire economic product will be distributed to those who provide inf inputs, labor or investment to the firm. So the uh, budget constraint for a worker is going to be this, P times his consumption will be his income. And what is the income? It's his labor income, his capital income. And then the profits are gonna be divided into two parts defined by a share, a lambda, between zero and one. This will be the workers fund and this will be the investors fund. And each worker receives profits in proportion to the labor that she supplied. And each investor receives profits uh, in proportion to the capital that she supplied. This, pro this parameter lambda is exogenous. In other words, workers are paid wages plus a share of the profits and investors are paid rents plus a share of the profits. And then there's no remaining economic surplus to distribute. 
So to be explicit, firms maximize profits facing PWR, they still maximize profits. The labor supply vector, now I'm defining it formally, the labor supply vector is a multiplicative Kantian equilibrium of the labor supply gain. So what does that mean? Nobody would prefer to replace this equilibrium vector by multiplying the whole vector by any non-negative factor rho. So I've simply put a rho in everywhere where the L's uh, appear. Note this game is monotone decreasing. Why? Because if other people increase their labor supplies, uh, this ratio, uh, my fraction of profits decreases. That's it. So this game in the Nat, if this were the Nash formulation, would uh, would be a monotone decreasing game. It would substitute. It would suffer from the tragedy of the commons. And here is the theorem. For any lambda in zero one, a sharing equilibrium exists under the usual convexity assumptions. And if labor supplies are all positive, uh, then for any share, share lambda, uh, the sharing economy equilibrium is Pareto efficient. There's no commons tragedy. If we substitute Nash for Kantian equilibrium in the labor supply game, the equilibrium would suffer from the tragedy of the commons. The paper then goes on to show how Kantian optimization can decentralize the efficient provision of public goods and public bads. The general lesson, I'm not gonna do that today. The general lesson is that substituting Kantian cooperation for going it alone allows us to eliminate the free rider and commons tragedies that afflict capitalism. Now a couple of comments. Should investors share in the profits? Should lambda equal one under socialism? That lambda equal one is just a labor managed economy or a labor economy where all the profits go to workers and investors simply get the interest on their, on their, uh, on their, on their uh, contributions. Now recall that capital will not quote come into being with blood and gore seeping from every pore, which was Marx's discrimination of how capital came about under capitalism. Because under socialism, we're going to have full equality of opportunity implemented through education, among other things. And so the disadvantages due to the morally arbitrary nature of endowments and the birth lottery, the inheritance of capital, or the production of capital through pillage and enclosure and so on will have been eliminated. So those who do not save do so by choice. This is a significant modification of the conception of socialism due to the development of political philosophy since Rawls. Nevertheless, I also insist that accumulation should be sharply constrained via taxation. Piketty has a triptych to describe taxation of income, wealth, and inheritance. So what's the justification for not returning a share of profits to investors if equality of opportunity has been achieved? I mean, what's the, what's the justification for taxing if equality of opportunities has been achieved? Why not allow freedom to accumulate capital? The justification for me is that solidarity will be impossible in a society in which the wealth income distributions are highly unequal. A community is solidaristic just in case each person views all others as being in the same boat with himself, struggling together against the constraints imposed by nature. According to H.G. Wells, a downtrodden class will never be able to make an effective protest until it achieves solidarity, which is the feeling of being in the same boat. Solidarity is defined by a dictionary that I used is a union of interests, purposes, or sympathies among members of the group. Now, some political philosophers today decree the emphasis that I place on material equality, saying the goal of the good society maybe it's called socialism, is democratic equality. This is particularly 
the philosophers Elizabeth Anderson and Samuel Scheffler. Under democratic equality, that's defined as a society in which each treats all others as equals. There may be some vagueness there, but that's the definition. Rather than replace material with democratic equality, I believe that solidarity is the penultimate goal, which engenders trust and cooperation. So without solidarity, I don't think you can have cooperation, which means uh, because people won't trust each other and therefore you can't achieve socialism as I've defined it. Solidarity, I believe, is psychologically inaccessible if people have very different incomes and wealth. So my story is, and I'm not sure I've got all the, uh, the, the, the nouns here arranged in the proper, proper, proper sequence, but I think, the, I think the story is that taxation of income and wealth is necessary to provide approximate material equality which then enables solidarity to exist. Solidarity itself implies trust because we're all in the same boat and we think of others as coming to the same, the same conclusions that we come to because of our common situation. That engenders cooperation, which gives us both socialism and democratic equality. Thank you. Well, that was perfect timing, uh, actually. So the floor is open if anyone wants to ask a question. Helen has her hand raised, so you go first. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John, fascinating paper. Um, I have a question about this assumption that uh, material equality will engender uh, solidarity. Uh, because if we know anything from the from American history that that uh, you know the material condition that should have united black workers and and white workers uh, didn't were not conducive to to solidarity. If anything, it it uh, it made the the white workers side with the capitalists against the black workers. So how does that how does that racial? I don't I don't believe I that's a case where the implication probably is misstated. What I really mean is that solidarity is only is only possible if people have relative material equality. There may be other reasons that people uh, don't want to do anything or don't want to cooperate with other people, such as ethnicity and race and religion. Uh, but I think that it's an absolutely necessary condition for cooperation that there be equality. So I agree, heterogeneous societies is a big uh, difficulty that socialism has to overcome to uh, enable solidarity, to enable cooperation. But, what, but what's the empirical evidence for the idea that it's necessary to have- Yes, um, yes I'm saying that material equality is essentially necessary for- Yeah, yeah but what's, what's the empirical evidence for that? It's a claim you make or it's, it's a, something- The claim I'm making, I said, I think it's psychologically impossible for people to feel solidaristic with others whose lives are much easier than their own because of being wealthier. Okay. That's the, that, in other words, I don't agree with the right, with the right wing's view that human nature is the, the selfish human nature is the, is the, is the death knell of, so, of the possibility of socialism. I think the death knell is the fact that material inequality makes solidarity impossible. That I think is part of human nature. Okay, it's a strong assumption. Thanks. Talmona. Is it me? Okay, so I have a question, uh, uh, John. I think you, you seem to give very little room for sort of social organization. I think historically, uh, solidarity sort of have. Uh, arisen in, in situation where people cooperate in, in specific organizations. They, they build up that, they build up trust uh, among the, each other, and they have some threats against the other that, that they also can, they can trust others because if they don't cooperate, then they can threaten them to, uh, uh, by inflicting some harm on them. You have you seen that uh, 
in all kinds of collaboration that uh, that uh, to have some threats in, in the background uh, seems to be an inherent part of both trust and solidarity. So I, I'm wondering a little bit why you are not uh, sort of uh, incorporating a little bit more of that. Historically, you've seen it in societies where they uh, had parts of what you sort of advocate. They have come about by sort of social organizations, uh, unions, for example. And you also see within unions, I used to say that in Belgium, that everything is a problematic in Belgium. They have different language, they have, they have a different religion. They, uh, sometimes they don't have government, but the unions in, in, in Belgium, they are always uh, sticking together. They have uh, people with different religion. They have people with different languages and uh, they cooperate. And the unions are very strong. In, in essence, much of Belgium is like Sweden, but uh, even with, with, with the problems they have. So I think this social organization where, where people in part participate out of self-interest and then change their behavior to be sort of a more Kantian in your language or, or solidaristic. So I'm wondering why you're not focusing more on this uh, formation of social organizations. Well, I agree with everything you said. I think it's the actual process is much more dynamic than I indicated in this very simple model. But I no, think that's fine. Arguments, your arguments are what are what I'm talking about. That the reason uh, that we're super. Okay. To, I use Mr. Masood. Fight together, despite their other differences, is that they were all in the same boat from the economic mm -hmm. point. So it's exactly what I'm talking about. Super. I mean, my main purpose here is not to be a social historian. It's to show that if people adopted this way of thinking or if the organizations that represented them did. So uh, let me comment on that. I think that it may be possible. It may be possible that the reason that the Scandinavian countries are so efficient and have such high labor force participation rates there's no free rider problem in that sense, the way they're in the United States, is because the unions maybe have implemented the Kantian solution. So the union, what, what is the essence of the Kantian solution in the labor supply game? It's that workers have to take account of the demo grant that they receive from, their, from, from taxation. So they, yeah. that's a positive reason to want to work. Mm -hmm. The individual worker may not see that so easily as the union should. So the fact yeah. that the LO was, you know, bargaining on the on the on the on the benefit of the entire working class, mm -hmm. uh, they might have been proposing the Kantian solution. As I say, I, one piece of evidence is that the labor force participation rates are so high in the five Nordic countries. They're all in the in the over eighty percent. Whereas in the United States and other OECD countries, they're closer to 70%. So that's exact, that looks like overcoming a free rider problem. I agree with that. I agree much. And I think it was, it was, it was very clear that, that, that they, they learned this from, remember that, that the Scandinavian countries have huge conflicts between First and Second World War. Huge conflicts, I would say, that are almost destroying the economies, and they learn also from that that the sort of the the, uh, the conflictual situation, the the Nash equilibrium, if you like, uh, was extremely bad with, with that experience, and in particular for small open economies that are so dependent on remaining competitive in world markets. But I, I know I understand better the, how we should interpret uh, the formalism here, and, and then I'm much more in agreement. I mean, the solidaristic wage policy has always been justified, as you just did, mm -hmm. by saying it was, it was needed to keep the, these economies competitive, to sort of mm -hmm force out the, the bottom feeders among the, the, the capitalist class who are just not competitive. Um, and so to do that, you raise the wage of the unskilled workers. But it may also, the effect of, raise, of, 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 of depressing the wage differentials was also to make people more materially equal. And that, no, I, in my view, I that can, solidarity. I, can... I mean, I'd love to do an empirical project in which, uh, I in, in, in which I or we investigate whether we can understand the labor supply uh, pattern in 
Scandinavian country as conforming more to a Nash a content equilibrium than a Nash equilibrium. Yeah, I but think I, that's a good I, idea. I made one attempt at it, but it didn't work. I'd like to do it again though. Mark Flerby. Yes, uh, thank you, John, for this uh, for this talk. Um, I'm intrigued by one question. So in the formal model, uh, you focus on the choice of labor quantities in the, in the game. Um, would it be possible to uh, have a symmetric focus on, on the supply of capital? So there is no special reason in the model itself for choosing labor as the focus variable. Is that right? Or am I missing something from the model? That's in fact the first way I wrote the paper. And, uh, and I gave, the way I did it is I gave people uh, a utility over labor, consumption and capital. The idea being that you wouldn't necessarily invest all your capital. Maybe you kept some of it under the mattress for security. Uh, and uh, I then decided as a, as a reaction to the referees of the journal uh, to simplify it by simply saying capital was inelastically supplied. But you're right. Do that there's no problem what you then have to have is two Kantian equilibria there has to be a Kantian equilibrium in the labor supply game and a Kantian equilibrium in the capital supply game and you need both at the same time to get efficiency you need them to be separate games you can't do it as a pair you have to each has to be a Kantian equilibrium taking the other as given so it's kind of a Nash Kantian right right as a worker you take the capital contributions as given and you think about uh, you think about transform, rescaling the labor vector. And as an investor, you think about, uh, you take the labor supplies as given and you think about transforming the Kantian. So, but formally you get this, you get the efficiency results still. Okay, okay. So you couldn't apply the same multiplicative factor to both capital and labor at the same time? That wouldn't work? No. Uh -huh. okay. there's no well, what's the notion, what's the counterfactual you, you'd think of? Just changing capital and labor by the same row, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So the problem is you have this no obvious way of, of thinking of a symmetric change. So the whole thing is based on symmetry, of, of, of capitalizing on the symmetry, uh, the, the thing that under Kantian equilibrium, everybody considers the same counterfactual of contribution profiles. In Nash equilibrium, each person has his own special space of counterfactual profiles where only he changes his contribution. So the mathematical essence of cooperation is that uh, the counterfactuals are the same for everybody. But that means that if you have multidimensional strategies, you can't apply the quantum reasoning to all the dimensions at the same time in one blow. No, uh, that's weakness. Okay. Let's do this the first approach to cooperation. Okay, I think Giacomo is next, and then we'll take a few questions from the audience, which have been hard enough. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I have uh, <clears throat> three uh, questions. The first one is a bit uh, technical, uh, but the two others not. So the first question is, if I uh, understood it uh, correctly, in the, in the first social democratic uh, model, you claim that it is a monotone increasing game because uh, uh, if everybody increases uh, labor effort, then also the demogram will increase and this will increase utility. But uh, assume now that uh, <clears throat> the technology is such that uh, maybe it is quite close to a Leontief technology, such that uh, a, a, an increase of aggregate labor supply determines a drastic uh, a reduction of the wage in equilibrium, then it is not clear to me that uh, everybody would uh, profit from this. So the first question is uh, whether it remains a, a, a monotone increasing game, uh, taking into account that uh, the wage in equilibrium also depends on, uh, on the labor supply. So the second is uh, actually there is a, a a movement, uh, especially in France, I think it, they called it uh, convivialité, uh, which is based on the idea that uh, actually social leisure time is a major source of, uh, of uh, welfare and that uh, maybe we uh, supply too much labor and uh, we could uh, 
have a better life by by uh, spending more uh, labor, more leisure time uh, together. So this would uh, imply that uh, uh, actually there is a, a negative effect uh, if uh, collective labor supply increases because then it is uh, more difficult to find the friends with whom you would uh, spend your um, leisure time. Is that is uh, uh, maybe there are hump shaped games, uh, not monotone increasing, not monotone decreasing. And my question is whether you have results also for hump shaped games of this kind where actually uh, you, you would like uh, that uh, the aggregate uh, contribution of the others is in some intermediate range and not uh, a minimum or, or a maximum. And the third question is more of a philosophical and more related to our, to our topic, namely actually if uh, one um, uh, thinks that uh, in socialism individuals would, would uh, be Kantians, then uh, it seems to me that also the standard uh, the, or the old fashioned centrally planned view of socialism uh, comes back into this course because uh, as uh, the uh, Hayekian and uh, uh, Oscar Lange, uh, Aro Horkwitz uh, debate showed, the main, uh, the main criticism against central planning, uh, at least in that tradition, was that uh, people have no incentive to reveal uh, their preferences, their technologies to the central planner. But if they are Kantians, so of course uh, uh, the golden rule applies and then, ev then uh, everybody would like that everybody tells the truth the, to the planner and then central planning becomes merely an issue of uh, complexity of uh, computing a solution, but then uh, the entire Hayekian uh, criticism is gone. And so maybe uh, centrally planned socialism comes back in the picture. What, what do you think about this? Okay, on the first point, you're absolutely right. The, the assumption of the model, and I, I state it clearly in the paper, is that all agents are price takers. So when they're making these, uh, looking at these counterfactuals, they assume the wage doesn't change, which is not accurate. If everybody increased his labor supply, the wage would fall. So, um, so that's the weakness of the, of the, of the model. Um, it's more of a weakness than in Nash equilibrium because in Nash equilibrium, um, if only you change your labor supply, the wage isn't gonna change. So uh, I, that's all I can say. In the paper, in the published paper, I, um, I look at an example and I model it the way you suggested that, that the wage does change when labor changes. And I, it was only an example, not a full theory, but my, my, my conjecture is that generally speaking, even allowing prices to move out of equilibrium, uh, you of course then have to have a theory of what the price is gonna be out of equilibrium, but uh, that the, the inefficiency will be much less than under capitalism. The second point, the leisure exter that's a leisure externality you're putting in there. And I have not studied that. Um, as I said, you can use this Kantian approach to deal with uh, various kinds of uh, externalities like emissions in the global emissions. I mean, you can, you can replace Pigu Piguvian pricing with Kantian equilibria. Whether you can do it in the example you gave, I don't know. I haven't looked at that, but that's a general, another general virtue of this, this approach. Now, the, in, the usual, in the usual situation, like the emissions problem, it's very clear that the game is monotone decreasing. So you were talking about an example where it's neither increasing nor decreasing on the whole space. Um, central planning, I mean, I think these are sort of, you know, qualitative vague points you're making. I mean, a lot would have to be done to make that rigorous. Uh, the, I think one of the virtues of the, <clears throat> of the approach that I've taken of, of looking at very simple decisions like labor supply or uh, uh, or investment supply, the the problem is really quite tractable. 
Uh, but I don't know exactly. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to jump from there to saying that this brings uh, central planning back. Okay, so formally time is up, but there are plenty of very interesting questions. So for those who are interested, I think there's plenty of food for thought. And if John is okay with this, I would encourage people to just stay and we'll deal with these questions. Colin. Um, uh, yeah, and I suppose he wants to ask a question that one of the attendees asked him to ask. Yeah, I just had my hand up to point out that there were questions in the chat, but Rico, if you want to read them, that's perfectly fine. Well, I can read them. Go ahead. Um, uh, John, just incidentally, there's also one in the Q&A. So there are a few in the chat and one in the Q&A. Well, which one do you want me to read? And I'll let you do it, Roberto. OK. So I think uh, the several of the uh, chat questions came first, and then I'll go for the Q&A. So Giulio Codognato asks, is there some relation between Kant equilibrium and Burge equilibrium? Um, I've been asked that before, so the answer is probably yes, but I can't remember what Berge equilibrium is, to tell you the truth. And I haven't, I didn't check it, although somebody else has made that question, so I think there probably is a relationship. Okay, Yannick Joseph uh, ask, uh, is asking Colin to read the revised version of the question I asked yesterday about debt to John Romer. I confess I can't get my hands on that uh, so okay i have it here um so it reads the last 40 plus years of global capitalism or neoliberalism were characterized by high levels of debt especially in the global south i welcome scholarly references to answer these questions to what extent will public debt in the global south to the imf western banks and in the u.s most recently to address pandemic and climate change in 2021 act as a barrier to expanding social democracy and efforts to address inequality such as free higher education and single payer healthcare. I would also like to know if Piketty has written about debt and the transition to social democracy or socialism. Arguments to balance the budget and avoid deficit spending will continue to be used against redistribution attempts in the US as well as against investments for global technology transfer towards a global green economy. Well, I have absolutely no, uh, no, nothing to offer. Uh, there are probably many people in the audience who can offer a better answer to that than I. I don't know about Piketty, whether he's discussed that. And in but fact, I, I believe somebody I has mentioned something about Piketty in the chat. So Isabel, Isabel replied. So I'll read the next question then. Uh, John, might not Elizabeth Anderson reply that the ethos of cooperation is itself an instance of relating to others and oneself as equals, and so democratic equality is built into socialism's ethos? You can, of course, argue that too much material inequality threatens the ethos, hence democratic equality, but the relational egalitarians will argue that what is fundamental is mutual respect as equals. And the empirical question then is how much material inequality is necessary for that, I suppose, material equality. Well, that's sort of what I said in the very last slide where I had all those, those that chain of implications that um, if you had solidarity, I think that and material equality, that would be the, those are the main preconditions of of, of democratic equality. So I think you'd get democratic equality uh, out, of, out of the wash. Uh, my objection to what Anderson and uh, Sheff uh, uh, Scheffler do is they, they're very critical of the so-called luck egalitarians for focusing uh, so much on material equality. And my view is that it's absolutely necessary to do that. That's the, I think the main thing that holds back uh, solidaristic behavior by, by the have nots, by the disadvantaged. So I think it's sort of utopian to think we can talk about 
democratic equality without addressing the issue of income distribution. Okay, so I think it's time for the question asked by Stephen, Stephen Darwell. Jo oh, that was the same one. Sorry, he asked it twice in two different um, contexts. Uh, Antoine Germain says, could you comment on the difference with cooperative game theory and the core solution concept? In particular, the de Broerskaff theorem says that no coalition of individuals have an interest to leave the market in a capitalist economy. Does that mean that absent market failures like public goods and externalities, individuals should not be Kantian solidaristic in your view? Well, that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting twist at the end. Um, I mean, from a formal point of view, I think there's no relationship between cooperative game theory and, and the and cooperation as I define it here. My approach to cooperation is very much a mathematical cousin of Nash equilibrium. Uh, it's very micro-based, whereas classical cooperative game theory just assumes that coalitions have these uh, opportunities if they decide to join. It's sort of solving the problem that I'm trying to, it's, it takes my problem of, of cooperation as already solved within coalitions. So I don't, I don't think there's really any, any formal similarity between the two. Jin Yu Lin asks, does the model still presuppose a situation where perfect information is accessible for a central authority or agents? How do you evaluate, say, the polycentric theory, Eleanor Ostrom, where perfect information is impossible and cooperation is introduced in contrast in information investigation? I had never thought of Eleanor Ostrom's theory that way. I've thought of her theory, the relationship to the, my approach, I thought of her theory as uh, basically converting, arguing for the uh, approach that, that societies learn to impose uh, penalties on people who aren't cooperators so that they do cooperate. That is to say, they make the uh, they change the payoff functions of individuals so that the cooperative solution is a Nash equilibrium of the new game. Uh, and I think that that's my view about that is that I'm, I'm conjecture that it's empirically wrong. That is to say, I think what's true is that most people, that many, many people, maybe not everybody, but many people are what I call conditional Kantians. So a conditional Kantian will take the cooperative action, say uh, not increasing his labor time on the lake, if uh, she sees that a certain fraction, that a large fraction of other people are also taking it. In other words, the opposition, the reluctance that people have to cooperate is largely because they don't trust that others will also cooperate. If they knew others would cooperate, then uh, they would cooperate too. Now, suppose you're in an equilibrium where you have cooperation, but you have a few Nash players who come into the society and they play the Nash strategy. So that decreases the fraction of people who are cooperating, and that will cause some conditional Kantians to stop cooperating if they have very high thresholds of cooperation. And then after those people stop cooperating, that uh, reduces still further the fraction of people who are cooperating and that induces more marginal people to stop cooperating. So the whole equilibrium can unravel. You may unravel to a point where there's another fixed point and you have cooperation at a much lower level or that level may be zero. So my view is that the, we don't know that it's not the case that uh, the penalties which are placed by these villages who are facing common pool resource problems against non-cooperators may simply be necessary to keep uh, a very small number of Nash players in line, but it's not that the other people need the penalties. They just don't, they just won't, they won't cooperate if other, if some other people stop cooperating because of this threshold that they have. 
So in that case, I would say you have a largely Kantian society of at least conditional Kantians. Uh, and uh, uh, you have to deter the Nash players from, from unraveling the cooperative solution. So that's been my view that, uh, that uh, Austria may have gotten it wrong. Um, and uh, I actually sent her a version of this some years ago before, while she was still alive, uh, when I was just beginning to work on it. Uh, but, and she wrote me back a, a nice note, but I don't think she read what, I, what I'd sent her. Uh, if, can I butt in for a second? Go ahead. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. I just, uh, I, I knew Ostrom's work pretty well. And I, I think she actually would have agreed with your interpretation that most of the people are conditionally cooperative and that they are just a few con a few Nash players. I'd like a citation on that, if you can give it okay. to me. Yeah. So David Frumkin asks, do you understand agents in your model as being altruistic? And if so, in what sense? It seems like altruism does not enter their utility functions, but it is somewhere in the background of the behavioral assumption. For Cohen, the socialist ethos centrally involves internalizing the interests of others, making them one's own. I'm very glad to get this question because I think you've hit the nail on the head, David. Um, my view is that uh, People are not altruistic in my model. Their preferences are the usual self-interested preferences. That's one of the virtues of the model. It's, it has classical preferences. The ethics comes in in the way people optimize, in the counterfactuals that they examine. The counterfactual that you examine as a Kantian involves cooperative behavior. The counterfactual you would, you would examine in the Nash optimization is non, is, treats other players as fixed. As parametric. So Jerry's, Jerry Cohen's view of the importance of altruism is not my view. And I think, the, I think there's a distinction between cooperation and altruism. And in particular, I think cooperation is much more easily achieved than caring for others. I mean, I think people basically can care for a fairly small group of people who, you know, their family and friends and that's about it, but they can cooperate with a much, much larger network of people. So I think it's from the point of view of, of bringing about a socialist society, I think it's much better to focus on uh, enabling cooperation rather than trying to make people altruistic. Okay, we seem to have gone through all the questions that have been asked either by panelists or by attendees. So if nobody else has anything to ask, then perhaps it's just time to collectively thank John again, as well as Colin uh, for putting this and Hira, of course, for putting together this wonderful conference and trying to revive the idea of socialism. So. Thanks a lot, John, on behalf of everyone and Colin and Hira, and perhaps another conference soon. Thank you very much um, for all for attending. And uh, let's stay together for a few minutes now, the participants to wrap up.